We weren't late, I swear to God. Totally not late. Don't report us to the principal. We were actually all here dutifully waiting around (laughs) for episode 55, and we forgot. We forgot to to be live. live. Yeah, Yeah. I was looking over here, and so I have these are out, and it was very distracting. I've heard that it does happen sometimes that people like get into their show like 15, 20 minutes, and they never went live. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a guest. Jana, I need you to pronounce his business name and human name. Richard Nichols, creative Coralophis. Yeah! Nailed it. I did it, guys. See, I can be taught. Um, We have a guest today, and we're talking about not ball ball pythons, and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank God. I think that's exciting for everyone. (laughs) Uh, um, I like... Crested geckos. Have I admitted that on the podcast before? I feel like I, I have. love crested geckos. I just don't have any yet. I've had them twice, and then for various reasons, not had them again. But they've always. I've. I think that they're great. So we needed to talk about crypto, and we needed to talk about crested geckos. So now we're doing it. Blackjack. Uh, I only practiced once. Okay, because I messed it up on my interview, and I wanted to not mess it up today. All right. Let's be fast. Is this a not safe for work podcast, everybody? I don't know. What do you think? Is that family friendly? Probably not. <laughs> Language, adult content, real talk about animal death, only on the whole back rack. The and worst. Janice boobies. And Janice boobies. Do we have a sponsor? Yes, technically, still technically. somehow. I'm, I'm surprised he hasn't uh, pulled out just so that he can be like, no. Shane never pulls out. He has like 70 <laughs> eight kids actually <laughs> yeah you can tell he's committed he's very committed <laughs> so shane was on the the uh, where are they now this week and he did a great job what do you think about his episode jana it was great i always love seeing shane i think he could do his own show or he could do a spinoff with chris eaton like he's just a likable guy you like listening to him he's very interesting he's always got lots to say and i I think the where are they now is brilliant. Um, I wish more people would do that. The, let's check back in with people because I feel like that's not. There's no follow through. So I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I'm glad that he's doing so well. Shane right. could definitely do his own, whether it's a live on YouTube or a podcast. He yeah. could definitely do it. He Mm -hmm. absolutely has all the right, I mean, other than time, (laughs) right? all the right features to, he could nail it. And I think everybody would listen. And I know I watched him when he was on YouTube a lot. So I just, I always enjoy it when he has content out. And he's working with, isn't it? He's got leopard geckos now and he's got hognose snakes. Yep. So he's got something other than ball pythons. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's now we're going to start sounding security. like we're hating on, <laughs> on ball pythons. I'll keep the ball py- I'll keep the ball python negativity down. No, it's okay. We can we can kick the ball pythons. It just was funny because we are normally like rah rah. Ball I I have ball pythons and I like them, but I yeah. even I too get tired of talking about them. So that's why we try to like, you know, pace it like a boa and then a corn snake and then a ball python and then like a generic industry and then like keep going because yes ball pythons don't do a ton (laughs) they're not super interesting (laughs) so well i have my middle daughter addy she wants a ball python and i told her they're named ball python because of what they do they're you know they are kind of the perfect pet snake but but i told her too i said if we're gonna buy a ball python i'm gonna spend a stupid amount of money on a snake that's a pet because i'm gonna want something that's amazingly beautiful oh just message me we can get her one i just hatched out a bunch of pies and and i'll send you one yeah no problem well, and my problem would be is i'd buy a cup i'd buy a ball python and be like you know what i should be like all the other ball python people and just breed these things <laughs> gotta catch but, them all but seriously message me no charge i will send one for your daughter for christmas she doesn't need to know that well, she doesn't watch, does she? It's not safe for work. No, it's not safe no, for children. <laughs> no. No. Uh, no, no but, but seriously, message me. We'll take care of it. Or message Shane, who's still a sponsor on Facebook. 
Shane More Kelly, the Instagram. sponsor. But that does not mean grinder. Grinder? He's on grinder. Rumble. Rumble. I, I had to throw grinder in there. Sorry, but isn't um, that like a dating app for gay men? Oh, oh, cool. Okay, it's all right, cool. Shane. We accept all kinds. I know. Um, let's do some quick shout outs. Who was here? JK. They're just kidding. Never knew Crested Geckos could get crypto. JK, I feel like they're stealing my initials there. Who are you, JK? <laughs> it's you. It's Quirky not was me. here. Richard was already here. He's double here. Good job. He's here as his business, not as RN, who mm -hmm. we shame. Tammy has some questions. Pronouns. There was a yes, bunch of I questions thought... at the beginning. Yeah, we'll Jan to needs to. to remember the questions. Blackjack's here. Hello. Creative Genetics. Hey, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Tradesman Zygotics. Lots of new names. Welcome. God bless you. Maybe. My husband's here. My God. Oh, your husband's here. So I can feel awkward about the assistants. It's just. No, there's fun. no awkward. Uh, it's I did weird? my best to promote this. So. Yeah, Thank is you. It, is it weird that my podcast wife's Super husband Snake Syndicate. named my boobs? I don't know. Comment what below, did he guys. name your boobs? He's Marissa the one that, that coined the assistants. Oh, is it? Yeah. Did he? Will's here. Will, the podcast whore <laughs> himself. Pico Welcome. Pythons is here. All right, let's not do this for too long. Stone Age is here. And oh, hi, Marshall Stone is Age. here. All right, we did it. That's enough of all that. Okay, I got to do my little spiel. Okay, tell us. Give me your 60 second elevator pitch. Go. Elevator pitch. So I am in the 15 minutes of lame contest. It begins November 17th and runs till Christmas Eve. You can vote on snakesandthefatman.com. There is a link in my bio on Instagram. There's also a link on Facebook, but who does Facebook anymore? And vote for me. You can vote daily. So if you want to vote for me and then, you know, shill to someone else once and then come back to just voting for me, that's okay. Mm -hmm. We accept all kinds here, but vote for me. <laughs> I was on uh, Proper Royals this week. Most of you were there. Thank you so much for coming and supporting me and getting all the nerves out for the maraud of interviews that I have scheduled. I will soon be the new whore will <laughs> mm -hmm. you should do one or two more i have a whole bunch coming up there's a list on my instagram of um, dates and times in eastern standard time and pacific standard time and this week i will be on with brian in what's in your cup getting up really early so we'll see how i even look <laughs> made us roll out of bed and come in my pajamas um, but super grateful that he's letting me come on and proper Royals let me come on last week. Also in that link in my bio to my bio, uh, it's my link tree. Um, I have links to my 15 minutes interview and my proper Royals appearance. And then as I go on these different shows, I will be linking them in there so you guys can catch them if you miss the lives. <sighs> but we are not here to talk about me today. So vote for me mm -hmm. and we're going to move on. Mm hmm. Oh, also, if you're in there here and you're commenting and you're participating and you're showing up, like, subscribe, help us out, guys. We want to hit a thousand. Okay, that's it. we're so far away, but you know every single person helps. So please subscribe. I want to hit six six six. Six six six. We all know what number I want. So <laughs> I only have three forms, right? Librarian, which is the form I'm in right now. Amish, which is the form I take while farming, and witch. So uh, obviously, I would be going for the mark of the beast as the uh, preferred subscriber number. Oh, my preferred subscriber number is anything that ends in sixty nine. So, <laughs> so I guess ten sixty nine is what we're shooting for, everyone. Mm -hmm. All right, that was uh, a little weird. So I'm I apologize. In advance. <laughs> Always a little weird. You just never know what you guys are going to get. <laughs> All right. Richard's just questioning yeah, his life like, choices fuck, now. Why do we do he's this? like, no, no, no. oh no, buckle up. <laughs> I've I've listened I've I have listened to every episode you guys have done. Oh so my god, it's been long enough to know. I know hey, what to expect. Are you a hardcore fan that you could listen for the little Easter eggs that she used to leave? I'm probably not that bright to pick up on okay. that. Anybody that ever feels the need to go back and listen through, Jessica always throws out like little Easter eggs, like either at the end or just randomly somewhere. And it'll be things like, 
I have to go to the bathroom. Or at the very end, they'll be like us swearing a bunch. It's pretty funny. Mm. Oh, no. I Yeah, I've heard some of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. The most famous is hot, sweaty titties. Jenna's hot, shouting that. sweaty titties. <laughs> at the top of her lungs. <laughs> popped in at the end. <laughs> I needed yep. to keep it in there. It was, it was gold. It was okay. vital. Yes, absolutely. Right. All right. Let's focus on our guests. We're the worst. Okay, Richard. <laughs> You volunteered for this, like a like a tribute in the Hunger Games. How did it, I felt like you wanted to share, so I was like, okay, let's talk. And we talked about what you want to talk about, and I agree with all of it. Sounds great. But what was your like onus for wanting to tell your story first? So we can hop in the way back machine here. When I first got into reptiles anybody whether you hop on youtube in any of the social media stuff you search talking about reptiles getting a reptile mm -hmm. the word quarantine pops up all the time quarantine 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 and because mm -hmm. obviously it's important so when i you know when i was a kid um living i live in minnesota the area i grew up in I could walk out my back door and across the street to a stormwater retention pond and find pretty much virtually all the native Minnesota snakes, except for like the timber rat order and a couple, couple of the other ones. Mm -hmm. So I've always been into reptiles. I had reptiles when I was a kid, didn't have them for the longest time. And just, it's now been five years. Well, it'll be five years in January here where I jumped back in and I was doing research because the other thing when you search, hey, I want, I'm thinking about getting a reptile, whether it's a snake, a gecko, a turtle, a bearded dragon, whatever. It's you got to do your research and figure out what you want and how to take care of it. Mm -hmm. So I had kind of narrowed it down. I was looking at leopard geckos and I was looking at crested geckos. And I went with crested geckos because at the time I'm like, I don't want to deal with insects at the time. So pick crested geckos. So you hear about, you buy, you buy an animal, you got to quarantine it. When you only have one, that's pretty easy. It's the only animal, it's the only reptile in the house. You really don't have anything to worry about. But once you start adding multiple animals, that's where you have to quarantine everything that comes in. So I had a, 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 a small collection considering what I have now, but it was, you know, under 20 animals at the time. And from watching YouTube, Dave Kaufman and Snake Discovery and some of the other channels that do videos at the NARBCs, I learned of this amazing show called the Tinley Park NARBC and decided, hey, I'm going to go. Yeah. So in March of 2019, I go to my first Tinley. I had a small collection of crested geckos. I had one breeding pair, produced eggs, um, had a bunch of eggs fail which we can get into that, what I learned from that, what I was doing wrong. Um, can I interrupt real quick? Very short question. Where did those initial crested geckos fr come from? Morph Market or like pet stores? Or local local cold. shows? Okay. The, co the cold-blooded shows. Okay. They do, there's a cold-blooded show that's, they do it four times a year here in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And then also um, Emily from Snake Discovery does a reptile show circuit so the first geckos i purchased came from shows okay. either the cold-blooded or emily shows from local breeders that was so, like pretty good right can i interrupt yep have you been to the snake discovery multiple times oh i hate you we need to come so bad we love emily she's like part of the reason we're in all this and she my daughter wants to be her when she grows up we watch every episode together as a family like i'm fan uh, early right now that you've even been there that's pretty cool. my my lame claim to fame is this very living room i'm sitting in right now emily has been in this room in this <laughs> house because she what? used to do she would do birthday she before she had her facility right right yeah she, she did the traveling reptile shows the birthday mm -hmm. parties yes. programs whatever and I watched her show. I watched her YouTube channel. My kids watched it. I would see her at the local Herb Society meetings. That's so and awesome. I had her come and do a program for my youngest daughter. And yeah, so that's my lame claim to fame. Been to the zoo multiple times. 
Um, Emily actually has some of my Crested Geckos. I've sold wholesale to her to carry in her wow. retail store. That's so um, awesome. <laughs> you know, I'm an acquaintance of Emily and Ed. Right, we right, hang right. out at Tinley. You know. Um, so what you're I, saying is that you could get me the inn so my kid could meet her. Well, all you got to do is go show up at their zoo on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays, and they do meet and greets when oh, they're right. in town. When they're in but town, when they're not at a show. Right. They are insanely busy. Yeah. Um, they're moving 100 miles an hour, at 24 hours a day. Yeah. And they are they're, constantly mobbed, like yes. celebs in yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I... I could go on and on about what I think about what Emily and Ed are doing with snake discovery and with the education. Um, They're paving the way for us all. I mean, most of us have them to thank for sales. I get right. sales every show from kids that are coming in that watch Emily and just adore her. And so I, I really think this is way off topic. Sorry, guys. But I, I well, really think that they're pioneering the industry in the correct way and in such a an insightful and a respectful and educating way that's making people realize that they're not gross, scary creatures, that they're these fascinating, wonderful creatures. And exactly. I, just, I just can't say enough good things about what they're doing for our industry. Yeah. It's they're, you know, I firmly believe in what they're doing and I'm a fan, you know, it's, fan. yeah, you know, they're, they're great people, but so, yeah, getting back, I decided, Hey, I'm going to go to Tinley in March of 2019. I actually brought my daughter Addie and you know, it was just going to be a weekend of where we we're going to look at reptiles, spend some, you know, daddy daughter time together. I had some money. I'm like, I'm going to this giant reptile show. Crested gecko breeders from all over the country are going to be there. I'm going to be able to purchase some animals that are going to, accelerate my breeding projects and I'm going to be able to talk to these breeders and ask questions because I'm, you know, I'm new to this. I don't know a lot. Um, I'm always looking to learn and get better. And Tinley's amazing until you've been at one, you really can't describe how amazing it is. Um, I won't miss one. I was just, you know, I, they, the year and a half they were canceled because of COVID was just awful. Uh, October 21, Tinley was amazing. March was great this year. This most recent one is probably the best one I've been to as far as my experience. Um, just it's on the calendar every year to go twice a year. Have you started so, vending yet or do you just attend? I just attend. I, when I, when I first got into the gecko thing, I'm like, I kind of had this five year plan. Hey, I want to be vending at a big show like Tinley park in five years. Mm -hmm. But now having been to so many Tinley parks, hung out with vendors, I spent a lot of time in October at uh, Eric and Katie Westmoreland's table with ECW. Did they do okay? Uh, what do you want to reveal? They had a good show. Okay. Um, I I blame Eric and Katie solely for my, you know, <laughs> rat snake problem. My rat snake problem. <laughs> Yeah, um, they were no, your they're, gateway they're drug. good people. I was just worried because oh. I know Joe vended Tinley like three years ago or something and sold like one snake or you know. Yeah, like, sometimes it, like the show circuit's hurting, especially in the south. No, they, I mean, Joe Phelan three years ago vended Tinley with corn snakes, and that's mostly what CW sells, and he couldn't move them even though he was a famous right. person. Yeah, Eric and Katie did well. I I spent. They were in the booth with um, Reptichip. So Reptichip has an end cap. So, and Reptichip's one of the sponsors. Right. And so they, that's how they got their table space. So they were in a good location. Okay. That's good. I, I spent they a lot did of time, good. Yeah. I spent a lot of time behind the table and it was, there were times where it was nice because there's so many people in front of the table to have that extra set of eyes just to watch out on what's going on, you know? and kind of help them out, whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I originally thought, yeah, I'd love to vend something like Tinley, but now I go there. And for me, it's, it's, I'm, I buy animals or I'm buying racks. I'm buying something, but it's, for me, it's a social thing. I don't want to be stuck behind a table for, you know, 20 plus hours over the course of two and a half days. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather interact with people and, you know, 
had just as long as I got a table to stash my cooler full of beer, I'm happy. You know, <laughs> that's what you need, though. Really, I was just gonna say that's how I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. It, so, but even this year on my way to Tinley, I made several stops to drop off animals that have been purchased. I met people near Tinley yep. to exchange animals. So there's a huge like secondary market that takes place at Tinley where everybody that shows up there, they're doing sales in the parking lot and the hotel rooms on their way there, stuff like that. But, you know, so going back to 2019, we did, we got the VIP passes, which for me is the only way to do a show like Tinley park. You get in on Friday when the vendors are setting up and I knew the vendors, the Crested Gecko vendors that were going to be there that I wanted to look at what they had. And it was nice to be able to stand right at their table, kind of just let them unpack and get set up. But as they're putting stuff out and pricing, you're, you got the first eyeballs on it, you know? Mm -hmm. So did my lap around the show, you know, looked at, figured out where people were, started narrowing down. I was looking for some specific animals for my projects. And there was one breeder that they were kind of in the back corner and I recognize the name because I followed them on Instagram and Facebook and the whole thing. And they had a couple animals that, you know, I'm like, yeah, these will work. The, I need these for my project. And at the time it was more money than I'd ever spent on a single gecko. Now I look at it and go, it was no big deal, but you know, these were 500 to $800 animals. And so I bought two from this breeder, bought some from another breeder. And just in that, from being at Tinley, I almost doubled the size of my collection in one weekend. So I'm bringing a bunch of new animals home all at one time. And I knew the quarantine thing was going to be, it was going to be an issue, but I had it figured out. I had pre-purchased a bunch of exoterra enclosures from another vendor. So I'm like, I'm going to quarantine this stuff here. I bought multiple animals from each person that I dealt with. So each separate group of animals basically had its own space. So when I got home, I get everybody set up. And then while those animals were in quarantine, I'd work the stuff I already had, take care of that. And then I'd work through um, cleaning, feeding, interacting, dealing with the new arrivals that were in quarantine, sanitizing along the way, wearing gloves, taking the precautions just because of the large number of animals mm -hmm. and you know, everything seemed to be fine, you know, monitoring poops and making sure they're eating. And you know, it's not that complicated with crested geckos, but those two animals that I bought from that one vendor that they, they were, to me, they were very important for what they were going to do for what I wanted to do with geckos. And we were probably 45, 50, maybe 60 days into quarantine. And one of them, it wasn't eating as much. And I just kind of attributed that to, it was by this time, it was early December and mm -hmm. being in the basement, cooling off a little bit, obviously they're not going to eat as much. And, you know, I just monitoring poops and everything seemed to be okay. And then it just, it became apparent because there was diarrhea. There was, when she did eat, she was, there were several times where she regurgitated. Did and she I'm have like, a right. mucusy or bloody stools or just wet stools? It was just like wet and runny, which okay. was completely different than I'd ever seen. Not that I had seen a lot of crusty <laughs> gecko poop at that point, but I knew something was up. So that became the last animal that I dealt with whenever I was taking care of the animals. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, there might be something going on here. But and, and, that, just, and at this time, you already knew what crypto was. You just wasn't sure that's what was going with her. But you had so some sort of general knowledge of crypto. At the time, I was aware of the big thing with crested geckos is respiratory infections if they're kept too humid all the time, mm -hmm. especially too humid and too cool. And, you know, I'd heard about like, you know, crypto and some of these other things, just very basic, you know, not nearly what I know now. Right. So I'm like, okay, you know, so I hop into Facebook groups. I'm asking people, you know, 
this is what's going on. What do you think? And got lots of different information. Nobody really said anything about crypto. And just through my Googling and research and talking to another local breeder, they said, that sounds like crypto, but you don't hear about it a lot in crested geckos. Usually it's leopard geckos. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, I'm going to make a vet appointment and we're going to do a fecal sample and see what we can see. So made a vet appointment, took the animal in. And by the time I was able to get that animal into the vet, like it had really started, it was a noticeable deterioration in its health. Mm -hmm. So I brought in fecal samples. They did a swab. You know, they did some things. They were going to run the tests. Um, I think they gave it like fluid injections, vitamin injections, things like that. Came back home. And that's when I started noticing the second animal from that same vendor that I had purchased. I started noticing signs with that one. And I'm like, uh oh, we got problems. You know, alarm bells yeah. are going off in my head. So, can I ask the age of these animals? Like some were ready to breed or some of these, them, you know, like these grams would have been, they whatever. were adults and okay. they were all, they would have been about two years old. Okay. So young adults. Yeah. And with crested geckos, I've actually changed. Typically you hear people talk about crested geckos. They more talk about the weight. Like you'll hear 40 grams, 45 grams for females to mm -hmm. you know be at the breeding size. So, and typically it's two years, 40, 45 grams. I've kind of switched. I'm waiting now three years because of the results I've seen with my collection. We can get into that too, if we want. Sure. But yep. so it was, I'm like, there's something going on with these animals. So it was like, almost like extra quarantine went into effect. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought, well, if this is crypto, this is highly contagious if I contaminate everything else and it can wipe out my collection mm -hmm. and just being just a couple years into this, I'm like that. I, I, I'm like, that was just a scary thought. So took the other animal in, did testing on that. They both come back. They had crypto. And at this point, the one, the female was so far gone even though they tried to treat with antibiotics and other things, it wasn't working. So we made the decision to euthanize a to protect the collection and B because it just, it was the humane thing to do. Mm -hmm. Euthanize the animal sent off for a necropsy and, you know, just to verify the crypto diagnosis and maybe if there was something else going on. And the only thing that came back was, yes, definitely crypto, this, this, whatever. The other one, the other was a male. It responded to the treatment. It seemed to recover, started eating again. And we're like, okay, it's on the mend. But crypto doesn't disappear. They carry it. And I had, it's either I keep this animal that has always got to be in this quarantine environment. And I got to keep it separate from all my other animals and future animals that I bring in. So I'm like, I can't have this animal in my collection and it's healthy and it's eating and it's, you know, it's, we seem to be in the clear, but I can't keep it in my house. So mm -hmm. I found somebody that would take this animal in. They knew the health history. They knew what was going on. And I said, you basically, as long as you have this gecko in your possession in your house, you cannot own another reptile because what it has can spread to everything else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's basically a pet and that animal is still alive and, you know, it's doing well. So that's kind of the positive whole thing that at least that animal is able to, you know, it didn't meet the fate of the other one, but having gone through that. And then after that, it's like, okay, I got, I thought I was doing good with quarantine and cleaning and sanitizing, but I just went down the rabbit hole and like, what can I do to absolutely eliminate or 100, you know, minimize the risk of something like this cropping up in my collection again with my new purchases that I was planning on doing. 
So I refined what I was doing for quarantine. I, you know, changed my cleaning regimen. It just became kind of ultra paranoid about it because I knew say a year from say we get into 2020 and I've got a hundred plus animals, I'm breeding, I've got babies. If I get something like crypto in a collection, it could, it'd be devastating. Mm -hmm. And as a fan of this podcast and having listened to every episode and the recurring theme, a lot of time is the biosecurity part, which it doesn't get talked about enough. The snake people, the ball Python people, there's more conversations about it. Um, there isn't enough in my opinion, but gecko people, crested gecko people, they don't talk about it. It, th it just doesn't get talked about. You know, they talk about quarantine and things like this, but they don't talk about the real risk. Mm -hmm. And having been through that and knowing what I know now, it's like, you know, and listening to stories like what you have said, Jessica, what happened with you with your collections and what you've dealt with and having to euthanize animals and just with what I have now in my collection, if something happened where I had to euthanize a large amount of animals, it'd be, it'd end it for me. I wouldn't be able to recover because yeah. these animals mean so much to me. Yeah. yeah. But were there okay. more animals in quarantine that were infected or was it just those two animals? Like it, got it was stopped. just, it was just the two. We're going to get a cameo here from my dog. Come on, dog. All right. Yeah. Oh. Give me a dog. Actually. We like dogs. Okay. So there's a question in the comments um, about emerald tree boas. Yeah. So there's two kinds of, crypto that are get into reptiles and infect reptiles, which is Serpentis and Baranai. Uh, both of them can get in lizards or snakes and they don't care. So if you're ever going to test, you should test for a full PCR panel, not not be like, I have a lizard, I will only test for lizard crypto. It's actually just right. like which one they were discovered in first. But if you just do like a gastric wash and you're just looking for oocysts, you can accidentally see parvum which is the kind that comes from mice which is doesn't infect snakes or lizards but you can see the oasis physically and you might be like that might be serpentis but it's you have would have to pcr to confirm species parvum just like passes through the snake doesn't matter and it's usually self-limiting infection in rodents like mammals like if you went to the pool and you like lick somebody's dirty uh <laughs> gym shorts or whatever and you got crypto you would have the runs and you would actually clear it completely it's just reptiles it turns out can't handle it that well especially in an animal that a gecko that's 35 40 50 grams i mean you know it yeah, just and it, likes being cool so it never like ramps up its immune system right to you know do anything yeah there's no evidence of any animal clearing crypto ever officially in the literature they all probably still have it just dormant in their digestive tract somewhere waiting for like an immune suppressing event to pop yeah. back up again whether it's shipping or breeding or something like that will you'll get the reoccurrence mm -hmm. where it'll it could go downhill pretty quick do we want yeah, to answer so the questions from the beginning real quick so that they don't get lost yeah, yeah let's do that i gotta uh, look at my Tammy asked, what products do you use to clean your enclosures? So I have a three-step, almost everything I have is in tubs. It's racks and tub systems because of the large number of animals I have. I have a three-step process. So if I'm going to, and this is whether it's the actual tub, the decor, anything that's in that tub um, goes through the same process. First thing is it's Dawn dish soap and hot water. And I let it soak for quite a while, rinse it off. And I use a brush on the tubs and on the water bowls and, you know, different things in the enclosure that I need to get like the big grimy solids off. If there's dried poop, food, whatever. So I do the Dawn and Dawn and hot water. And then it goes into a, everything will then go into a chlorohexidine soak. Um, it's probably, I do about a 25% solution. So I just take, you know, it'd be a gallon of chlorohexidine to four gallons of water, you know, so it's basically a one to four. And 
everything gets tossed in there and gets soaked for quite a while. And then they get pulled out of that. They get rinsed off again. And then I've got a steam cleaner and everything gets hit with the steam. And then about probably every third to fourth kind of deep clean that I do, the first thing I will do is use 12% hydrogen peroxide and just spray it on everything. Cause you do it outside. Uh, so you no, don't, like spray on yourself. No, it's, I wear, it burns. You wear gloves? I, yeah, it, it'll turn your skin white instantly. It'll just, it burns. Yeah. I wear yeah. the, I've got elbow length gloves, you know, heavy duty. They're actually, they're designed for handling stuff like liquid nitrogen. So, okay, good. Little, yeah. I mean, little, that's, sorry. A little bit of overkill for 12% hydrogen peroxide. I know, but like I, it does hurt you though. So like, yes, OSS are very strong. They need the strongest stuff of all super high heat, super UVB, long exposure. Yep. Boiling water in an oven for a long time or ammonia or high, high concentration ammonia or high concentration. Yep. And even you, know, you, take, you, you take a little dish that's got dried up Cresta gecko dye in it, put some 12% peroxide in there and it bubbles up and just like disappears, <laughs> disintegrates it. I mean, <laughs> but that could happen to your hands. So like, that's yeah. probably why you do it every three times. That's because you're like, there's a certain extra procedure to like, the steam is probably doing enough, but you're just extra careful to not yeah. propagate. Yeah. J yep. Just to mix yeah. it up. So and good. So, you know, I'll do the peroxide and then it's the other three processes. Um, that's kind of the, the deep clean part. Um, you know, even I would say it's at least what, like, something I do with, we can get into like the breeding thing with my, I use 66 quart Sterilite tubs for breeding for my breeding pairs, sometimes trios. Um, but throughout the breeding season, those tubs, the breeder female tubs will never get deep cleaned because Cresta geckos, they're all about scent and they're mm -hmm. about the pheromones. So I will spot clean and I have a little spray bottle with chlorhexidine or I'll use vinegar sometimes. Um, so I'll spot clean, get the poop and stuff out, spray what needs to be scrubbed. But I try to minimize how much cleaning is done to the main part of the tub because I've had it happen where a breeder, you know, a breeder female will be laying eggs consistently every, you know, 30, 35 days. You do a deep clean on the tub. And she gets confused and may not lay for yeah, 60 days. She's not feeling sexy anymore. She's right. like, this is not yeah. cool Give for me. Give me my sexy back. Right. Right. So generally the the three or four step process that I use, that's for like my baby bins. They get done at least once every week to 10 days, um, just depending on how nasty they get for that full deep clean. Um but, you know, just, I have other reptiles. I mean, I've got an Aki monitor. I've got a couple bearded dragons. I have some other species of geckos that I work with. Mm -hmm. So I've got a bunch of stuff going on. So there's always cleaning and sanitizing going on. But um, I've also used, I'll occasionally rotate in, like I'll use F10 mm -hmm. um, to clean some stuff. But generally that three-step regimen of the dawn and hot water, the chlorohexidine soak, and then the steam is going to do what you need it to do. And you're going to be relatively secure and safe, you know? Yeah. Not to say that like dawn and hot water are like a miracle, but they are slippery and wet. So they can move things and OSS are pretty big down the drain. So being slippery and wet is probably takes actually most of the, potential risk away but you want to like double tap and then triple tap right these are the right. rules of zombie engagement and also the rules of biosecurity <laughs> yeah you probably handled most of the risk which is soap and water but we'd like to be extra safe and i will say the whole three-step process thing you know going back to you know that's emily from snake discovery did a video on that 
when they, I think it was one of those ones when they were getting their bull snakes ready for brumation. Mm -hmm. And then they went through how they clean the tubs after that. And that, Mm -hmm. I think they actually did, they start with, they do the peroxide. Then I think they just rinsed with water. Then they did the steam. But, you know, and she talked about a couple of different, you know, you can do kind of, there's these three steps and kind of the different things you can use. So you're kind of hitting whatever you're trying to kill and sanitize with three different modes of, you know, mm-hmm. action. So, you know, and I just, I'm now with what I've been through and realizing, Hey, even my quarantine worked because it didn't spread. So that's a positive, but I used, I'm like, okay, it could have gotten a lot worse and it could have spread, but at mm-hmm. least what I was doing at the time worked. So let's just now kind of overkill it and mm-hmm. be really hyper vigilant about it. And did, did you test anything else in quarantine or did you just test only animals that were symptomatic? It was quarantine? only the two animals that were symptomatic and those two animals that were symptomatic, they were in a separate room from all the other animals that were in quarantine. And they were from one vendor. Yes, one vendor. Okay. But you didn't and test the animals in the other room that had just come in. Like in case you had like touched them in the car on the way home or something. You know, I I I would have tested mm-hmm. if I saw signs or symptoms. Okay. But I didn't. And now you want to test right now because I'm weirdly <laughs> pressing you about it. Well, no, I would say if I could if there was something in addition that I probably could have done or should have done is I probably should have tested everything else that came home with me from Tinley. Yeah. Cause it was bumping around the same car. Correct. You know, whatever you, your hands weren't necessarily fully accounted for at all times in that car right. necessarily. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's so yeah, my biosecurity was say, okay to good, but it could have been better. You know, I should have tested everything else that came back and, you know, if everything came back, okay, we're good, then we're fine. But if I had additional issues, you know, so maybe I I probably dodged a bullet there, you know, listen, even St. Jessica is not actually perfect. I fucked up all kinds of stuff. So I'm not, this is a low pressure situation. I was just curious. Um, Just in case anybody wants to know. If you go to RAL, wee, this is the reptile testing sheet. You just go all the way down. You if you're going to do that? a crypto test, you need to... Can you see it? No. Zoom in to the bottom so they can see where the crypto is. Crypto panel, $25. This is a poop. It doesn't have to be overnighted. It can be a cloacal swab. It could be the result of a gastric wash, which you would do with your vet. Or it could just be a swab of poo. If the poo is dry, you could rehydrate it with distilled water or just very clean tap water. Hopefully you don't have another kind of crypto in your well. <laughs> that would be, but that's yeah. a different problem. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and you can use the swabs that are for oral or you can use his dedicated poop swab. So it's only $25. Just double check. Um, and because it doesn't have to be overnight, you can like find poo as you go for a couple weeks. Keep it in your fridge so it doesn't smell too bad and then send it in. Because the oocysts persist, so all you have to do is lice them open and then look for the DNA. And this is... It's not that bad. Is it that bad? $25? It's not that bad. To me. Nope. To me. Have you ever used Ral? Uh, Richard? Or what did no. your vet use? I... I, another... still have the re- I still have the results someplace i'd have to pull them and see who they actually use um what was the name of the lab to the lab jana it has like a triangle it's like american veterinary and exotic lab yeah, you know yeah. it's very like generic sounding i know what you're saying but i'm trying to recall because i've seen their symbol most mm-hmm. vets use that one for crypto yeah, yeah. i was going to say that's like the standard vet pcr test site i'm trying i'll look you keep talking okay you know i'm like the just talking about the testing it's i would 
yeah, I j- just thinking about it now, it's yeah, I absolutely probably should have tested those other animals that came back with me from Tinley. But I know now. So the other thing I learned from this experience is anytime a new t- animal comes in, it obviously goes into quarantine and it's, it's pretty strict. It's, you know, that's like if it's one or two geckos that I pick up at a show, they're the last things I deal with every time I'm dealing with my animals, but they're absolutely isolated 100% from everything else. And you know, for at least 90 days, you know, maybe even right. 120. So yeah. Yeah. I, just, I mean, it, that's like the bare minimum though. Right. Like what yeah. if you got that lucky crested gecko? That's like really good at keeping its crypto under control, but is actively spreading. osis. you know, this is like the debate. It's like, how much is just biosecurity enough or how much does testing complement it? I don't know all the right answers, but right. you got it was okay. Especially if How, you're like sick in a breed group with a male who's like thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> right. It's like an exanthic lily or something. Don't you want to like double check he's not putting his peens in somebody who's kind of gross? I don't know. See, I I haven't done it yet, but if I if I was gonna spend multiple thousands of dollars on you know, something like an Exanthic or a Sable or the Cappuccinos or the Frappuccinos or, you know, these new morphs that are, you know, being brought into the hobby. If I was going to spend a bunch of money on one, yeah, it'd come in and I'd test it for the exact reason you just said. Would you ask them before you bought it? Like, have you ever done that yet? Like, ask a Chris no. Gecko seller, like, do you... Uh- test yours or can i test it on intake once it poops for the first time or it's hard i would poop so there's like a delay there for sure i would i would put i would bet very very large amounts of money that if you asked even the big name crested gecko breeders they tell you to pound sand and eat shit no if you ask them do you test for crypto 99 out of 100 of them are going to look at you and go what the hell is crypto did you ever? And, uh, and then they say, they say, you mean Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, did you ever they're, they're... listen to From the Ground Up? He had a crested gecko breeder. And I don't remember who it was, but that guy was the only guy, crested gecko breeder, I've ever heard be like, yeah, I tested all my breeding stock three times on intake. And then they go into a room and they live there forever. And that this was like four or five years ago. Jana looked that up too. <laughs> the, the one crested gecko breeder I've ever heard who was like serious about cr- crypto what are you doing hey tits i'm looking this shit up that you just told me to (laughs) i was was trying sorry i was trying to find the medical one that we were just talking about i couldn't find it but now i'm looking up from the ground up i'm doing my job all right you're doing great all right we had a question in the chat i'm missing it from the ground up yeah the port city python yeah port city python he had one crested gecko besides tiki's tiki's was on there too but he had another one who was like i tested three times that uh, seems vaguely familiar. I may have watched that or listened to that. Yeah, yeah. I it was a long time ago. I should have double checked. Right. All right. Marissa asks, "What kind of hydrogen peroxide are you using?" And you can answer, of course. Uh, it's just it's the twelve percent. Do you um, buy yours on Amazon? Because I sell it like for cleaning in like high concentrated amounts, or do you buy it from somewhere else? I there's a, a janitorial supply company that I buy it from. Yeah, it's just I'm. I never even thought to look on Insta or on Amazon. Yeah, but I'm there's sure some you... on Amazon. There's some on like Uline. Like you can get big old jugs of it. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got a small barrel of it basically. <laughs> right. So you're good for a long. Right. Yeah, and it's if you're searching for it, like you search, you could search twelve percent hydrogen peroxide, or you can also search for just like cleaning hydrogen peroxide and usually that'll give you the results for the 12 percent because that's the high concentricity right it's like and the lower concentration ones work less and less like your stuff you would get from you know cvs doesn't really wouldn't do anything right it'll turn to water before it does anything but i think sometimes you can buy eight percent and like 
there's a paper which I'll try to find and put in the show notes. It'll tell you like the contact time for the percent of peroxide versus time and how much oocysts are left. So like if you did use 8%, but you wanted a contact time of like whatever, I'm, I'm making stuff up right now, 20 minutes, that would kill 90% of oocysts. But if you did 12% right. for five minutes, it would kill 100%. Like, so there's like a, a ratio there of like, if you really, you're in a pinch and you couldn't find it or whatever, you could sort of do it. But there's whole like papers, and this is for like humans, like, because crypto acts, obviously we can pass it, but hospitals have like figured it out. Like how long do they need to stick something yeah. on something contact time wise to get 99% gone? Right. I have a right. question. What was the not correct gecko that was on there? Tiki's. So is it New York Herp Revolution? Do they do crescent geckos? They're talking ge geckos with Valerie and Scott Borden. Maybe. Maybe Three that's why ago. I don't remember their name because I. Do you recognize them, Richard? No. No. That's the only one that's coming up. It must be it though. Every time I type in crypto, I, I get crypto bro stuff. I don't even get anything with right reptiles. Well, it, just, <laughs> it it gives it just gives me something that I can do when I go to Tinley in October. I can walk around to these bigger crested gecko breeders and some that you know they know me or I bought from them or you know I may just walk around and say, hey, I'll just ask every crested gecko breeder there, hey, what what do you know about crypto? You know, and do you test or if I was going to buy a gecko from you and I'm testing on intake and it came back positive, what are you going to do? It, I'd just be curious because I, I would get a lot of, I'm betting I would get a lot of blank stares, just people looking at me like, huh? Because it's just, they're, they're it, this is all reptiles. It's not just crested geckos. There's just a lot of breeders out there that don't give a shit. And either they don't know, so it's ignorance, or they know about it and they just don't care. Right. Um, That's the part that I get in trouble for. Because I'm like, if they know and they don't care, they are culpable for bad things happening. But if they right. don't know and would care otherwise, then some education would be helpful. Right. Um, and people are like, you're paranoid. And I'm like, yes, I am. But... How do you explain someone who you know knows, but then doesn't do anything about it? And then you're like, is it like the denial phase of grief? Or is it, you know, like I'm already busy, so I can't add another like input on my plate? Like which part of the process are they in? Or are they literally just being a dick to other people and animals? Because they don't care, really, right. about animals. And this Berkey is says where... he buys 35% and dilutes it with distilled water. Yeah, it'd probably be economical too. You know, and it's uh, that's why I have I have a group of where most we're crested gecko people. We all have crested geckos. We breed them some to, you know, larger extent, you know, and some just have some, but we ha I have this group of people that I'll be like, you know, they're always lo looking on morph market and we post stuff that, Hey, you might be interested in this, or you might be interested in that. Or I can go in this group text and say, Hey, have you heard of, what do you think about this person? Have you ever dealt with this person? Do you have any, do you know anything about this person? Good, bad, or otherwise. And I've learned a lot of things about a lot of bigger name Crested Gecko breeders that has right. changed my opinion of them after seeing the experience that some people that I trust and deal with have what they've gone through with animals that they bought from these people. And you just, you got to vet who you're buying from and you have to trust them and, you know, just don't buy from sketchy people. I mean, there's, there's a lot of sketchy people out there, but even the best, the big, you know, not that Tiki's geckos has probably ever had problems, but you buy a gecko from Tiki's, you think this is going to be great, but it doesn't mean you skip the quarantine process. I don't right. care how much you trust him. You still quarantine. You right. know, there, there's, there is a problem of like prestige must equal good or great or quality or, or whatever. And you're like, 
Listen, I've been looking at Crescent Geckos recently on Morph Market, and I do not get it because there's clearly like a a, a price bias for names. Because the correct there's an extreme Harley like dark base, nice, looks great from like Joe, and then like from somebody else, it's twenty five hundred, and then from them it's five hundred, and they're both males, and you're like, I I I. I there's a bias there, which is fine. There's a bias in ball pythons too, but it seems very strong in crested geckos. And I don't know if right. it's because of reputation or right and or what. Kind of my thoughts on that is you have me as a crested gecko person, I can look at morph market and be like, okay, like I'll see an animal that has good structure. It looks good, nice contrast, whatever. It's a good example of you know, that morph, whether it's a Harlequin or whatever, and be like, okay, at that price from that person, if it's a well-known name, okay, I get it. But if I see that same animal from somebody that doesn't have the big name and it's priced way less, I'm like, well, that's a really amazing animal that I'd probably spend a lot more money on, but I'm going to buy it at that price and ask them if they've got three more that look like it. Right. Um, You'd have to be like, are, is it cheap because it has crypto like or whatever, like other problems? Like it's a female that and, lays slugs too. And I think about that also, but I'm like, there is no reason why some of these things should be 2,500 when this was like person, this normal human with like a cool Instagram. It looks like they care. They have like enriched enclosures, whatever. They're the same <laughs> to me, you know? Right. I bring right. snakes. And, what am I talking it, about? But it's the same thing, you know, Say Justin has yes the Justin tax you, yeah you 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 look at that it's the same thing in the crested gecko market um right but I think the Justin tax is like twenty percent this crested gecko tax is like oh I thousand dollars <laughs> like four hundred percent we I could crack open that group text and I could scroll through and you know somebody will post a picture and be like what the fuck is this person thinking pricing this animal at this price. You know, and we all yeah. will generally agree that that's pretty ridiculous. It's definitely but, the like JC Penny model where like everything's too expensive and then everything's always on sale. And you're like, I see what you're doing, right. which is fine. Like that's but, a way to, to like make people be like, oh, it's a great deal because it's Black Friday's coming up, everybody. <laughs> but if you're looking at like me as a breeder, I'm looking at Morph Market looking for potential breeding stock. Yeah. If if I see an animal that is just like, okay, that's amazing. I want that. It fits into what I'm doing or I'll buy this. And then I got to find something else to pair it to. Mm -hmm. If it's priced, like what I think is below value, I'm like, well, why is it so cheap? Right. It's become, suspicious. I'd be, I'd be more inclined to pass on a cheap animal because I'm like, why are they trying to get rid of it? Especially if it's a female, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. out there that they'll have, They'll have a female, whether they raise it up, they bought it, they try to breed it. It's a terrible breeder. And then they try to dump it for cheap. And just because female crested geckos are in high demand. I mean, mm -hmm. I, if it fits my project, if I can reasonably trust who I'm buying it from, or, you know, if I see a female crested gecko that is either ready to breed, proven breeder, that I can just plug right into my stuff. I'm that's what I look for. That's I'm I'll spend the money to buy it. But if it's priced really, really cheap, I'm going to be like, there's got to be a reason why. And it raises all kinds of red flags. Yeah. I mean, it's the same way in ball python sort of, but like there's enough produced that there are a certain number of females floating around at all times that, that there's nothing wrong with them. You just right, like, right. Cause they just are a lot and people get in and out. Like there were two crested gecko collections people are getting out of in texas that were online for sale just the whole thing bye and i was right. like yeah i mean those snakes are probably or snakes <laughs> geckos are probably fine this is hard snakes geckos so what what do you what do you look for in a like go ahead um uh, just in the comments um aurelia aurelio asked uh, what the purpose of the deep cleanings are. And I just wanted to reiterate um, that we are a biosecurity podcast and we are talking about bi biosecurity in crested geckos 
and other reptiles, not crypto coins, because apparently some people who tuned in thought that's what we were going to be talking about today. This isn't about Bitcoin. It's not about Bitcoin. We're talking about biosecurity and the purpose uh, the of crypto crash. They're all worth nothing now. Correct. Congratulations, We're talking about um, how to effectively clean your enclosures when you're doing a deep clean in order to prevent the spread of diseases amongst your colony and to make sure that, I mean, you don't usually put your same animal back in the exact same tub. You just want everything to be freshly clean, but on every level. So you're not just visually clean. You want to clean it so that um, any viruses or bacteria are not going to be spreading to your other animals. Did anybody else want to? Or parasites. Yeah, it's just Crypto the, is, a, is a parasite, technically. The For me, the deep clean, like I've got, I've got breeder females. They've been in the same exact tub for three, going on three years now. But once a year, that tub, usually I do it in like December, that tub gets deep cleaned and, you know, I have another container for that animal to put in while the tub is going through the deep clean, then everything gets thrown back in there and the okay. animal goes back in. And it's just the, the deep clean, you've got to do it at least once a year, if not twice a year. I know people that do it once a month. With ball um, pythons, I do it once a month. Right. And you know, generally with, um, especially with my babies, you know, from the time it hatches to the time it goes into my hatchling rack, and then it could it could hatch, and then within six eight weeks, I've sold it. Um, so anytime I sell an animal, that tub automatically gets deep clean yeah. and gets just stacked up. You know, so when I have more animals hatch, I can I have a tub that's clean, and I can put the baby in it and get it in the rack. But even though I've got this stack of six quart tubs that I put hatchlings in that I've already deep cleaned, a lot of times I pick that, pull that tub off the stack and I'll, you know, when I, I'm checking the incubator, I'm like, okay, I'm going to need, you know, eight tubs to put hatchlings in. I'll grab those eight tubs and I'll spray chlorohexidine in it and mm -hmm. let it sit for 15, 20 minutes because I'm making labels for the tubs. And then I rinse the tubs out, put the stuff in, put the animals in. So They've already been deep clean and gone through my three or four step process. But even before I put that new animal in, and even though I know that tub is safe or it's clean, I still hit it with the chlorohexidine again. Yeah. Maybe it's paranoia, but it's just, I know, hey, it's been hit it's multiple just, times. Yeah. Um, also, AJ, we're not talking about throwing anything away. We're not talking about um, getting rid of anything. We're talking about cleaning and reusing what you have. Um, yep. the only thing that you would throw out would be like bedding, um, because you're supposed to replace the bedding. Frequently. Well, he's saying like, if you got one or two animals in and, and they were in your quarantine and they were positive to be sure that crypto would not still be on those items, you just throw them away, which if you were doing like cheap stuff, like tubs and like oh, so cheap oh, Amazon right. stuff. So, so yeah, yeah, that's fine. But like, the point is like, you don't necessarily know at all times the crypto status of all your animals, even if they seem fine. So your between right. animal cleanliness needs to be at the highest level, even if you think they're fine. So like if you're moving tubs or having grow ups move into like a, an, old, an older colony's old tub, you would want that tub to be fully sterile so that when they enter it, it's not like a, a fomite at that point from... Because you don't always know what they have. And, and it's not just crypto. It's everything else, too. Everything a crusty and, gecko could have, they could have at any time. You just have to try to keep them sanitary. And all the the enclosures that the two animals were in that were crypto positive, the animals were removed from those enclosures. I deep cleaned them. And then they sat outside in the sun for, you know, from like May to august yeah. and they were getting you know 10 hours or 12 hours of direct sunlight every day and uvb will kill a lot of stuff when it's sitting out there that long yeah and they they can't persist like if, let's say they were somewhere not in uvb they were just in the environment they, they don't live indefinitely in soil the way some right. do so like just leaving a like if you bought a rack just push it in your garage for six months or a year that right. would actually defeat them that way eventually but the that's sun what, will, will wreck it 
That's Hard. what I did with my um, Nido rack that I had uh, my two snakes that were Nido positive that I allowed to stay alive until they laid their eggs. Um, then my whole rack got deep cleaned and put in the garage and it's been six months. Yeah, it's probably time to bring fine. it out and re rewash it all. But um, yeah, just the time alone can can do a lot of things. But yeah, yeah, just, uh, yeah I, I saw the question here. Yeah, it's the I agree. If you've got something, if you have an animal that's got crypto test positive and ends up dying or you euthanize it. Yeah, it's either throw the stuff away or literally just let it sit for. Put it in quarantine for six months yeah, or three months or it, whatever. Right. The, the equipment. Yep. Yeah, the equi the stuff's not going to survive, you know, uh, you know, more than six months on a dry surface. So, but yeah, th just the overall, because of that experience I had, just I do the deep cleaning. Just that's something you should do at least once a year. Um, and like I said, every time a bin gets pulled out of a rack and the animal is sold or it moves into a bigger tub or whatever, everything gets deep cleaned just so I know I'm sterile, you know, because you right. don't know what that animal has. And even though like, ammonia will burn you to pieces, but like steam is kind of cool because it like it'll, it'll like steam off urates off of stuff. So it's not like that part is like onerous. So if you're like including that in your like regular cleaning, it's fine. It's like that's a good crypto like dampener because it gets really hot, but yes. it also is just good at cleaning because it's steam. So right. like, it, there's nothing, it, it, it's not quite as onerous as a, adding ammonia to your program. Um, Cause it, it steam is hot, but hopefully you're not putting it in your eye. So that's bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> but oh, that's my like, next thing to buy is a steamer. Yeah, I love my steamer. It's fun. I don't talk about it enough. No, you don't. It's good for all kinds of stuff, and and, and you can even like steam your like show show tables and stuff because it would be fine. It doesn't yeah. leave a residue or whatever. That's great. That's yeah. That's the next thing on my list for sure. What yeah, kind of steamer do you use, Richard? Quirky asked. Oh, it just it actually it's something. Um, <laughs> it's a funny story how I acquired it because I I was looking for one. And my wife, Jessica, had seen on Facebook Marketplace, somebody was getting rid of, they were, selling, they were selling a steamer. And I'm like, sweet. And it was cheap. And I'm like, it still works. So I went and bought it. And that's what I've been using. And then the funny story about that is, so I, and she lived in the same town, this person lived in the same town that I do. And it was like, I don't know, six, seven months later, it was like in this time of year in November, she had po that same woman had posted in the local town Facebook group saying, Hey, do you know anybody know who the guy is that I sold a steamer to him, but he breathes, <laughs> he breathes reptiles. And my wife happened to see it. And she's like, she, she's like, I wonder what this is about. So she, they got in contact and then she gave her my number and the woman called me and said, Hey, you still, you're doing the crested gecko thing. I said, yeah. She goes, well, we want to get one for my son for Christmas. And I'm like, oh, sweet. Cool. So yeah, it was, I think I paid 25 bucks for it. And it's literally the steamer that you would use for clothes. So it's got the reservoir tank that is on wheels. Like yeah, this one? Or something yeah, like that one? Yeah, I have one, like something like that. Yeah, Ugh. that basically, basically that style. And yeah, it was 20, I spent 20 or 25 bucks on it. So new, they're like between like 50 and 75 dollars or whatever and you get and you the little can, ones the handheld ones too They're and i've seen they make ones that they'll hold like 10 gallons of water and they put out just an amazing amount steam of the steam. Shit out of yeah <laughs> they're they're several hundred dollars and i'm actually thinking about buying a bigger one because you know with my little small reservoir when i fill it with water i get through a half a dozen tubs depending on the size before I'm out of water. So I'm constantly adding water to it. So I'm thinking about buying a larger one. Yeah. Somebody asked, I forget where, like what temperature and it's not like a hundred percent of all the, 
the crypto is killed by the temperature of a steamer because it's like 165 degrees. So you would need to do 165 degrees for X amount of time to get 100% of all O's that's destroyed. It's like 20 minutes or something. I'll have to bring this paper up. We'll do it one day. But doing it a little bit might get you 70% of them there. So just hitting it real quick. So if you had washed them, yeah. soap, right. sanitized, and, wa- and then steamed it, did you accidentally get 99% anyway? This is maybe not medical grade, but like, you know, you're between You've done your, due, your due diligence for sure. Right. If you could stick all of your crusty geckos in an autoclave and have them come out as not cri- crispy critters, that would be 100% <laughs> effective. <laughs> <laughs> But you can't, so you, it turns out. So, so you we wouldn't to, recommend that if you had a crypto animal in that enclosure. We're just saying this is... Yeah, I would use ammonia too. But as like your household double check, that's what I'm saying. Well, I mean, maybe yeah, we should put Crusty Geckos in an autoclave. I don't... That my that three-step process, <laughs> that is, you know... I, I would, even if I never had an animal that tested positive for crypto or never dealt with it, that's what I would do anyway because... It's just, it's, I've seen enough people talk about it and it makes sense. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I never finished, but I got pretty far into completing a bachelor of science degree in biology. So are you, going I have, back? do you want to go back? It could be fun. I yes. would, it would just for kind of my own personal satisfaction yeah, because I can yeah. say when I start talking about scientific stuff, I can say I'm a goddamn biologist, so you got to listen to me, you know. <laughs> yeah, nobody now listens just, to you. Trust me. <laughs> now it's just now it's just some guy on that likes reptiles that spouts off scientific stuff. So, mm-hmm. but it's just that's the cleaning process I use because you know even I just I want things to be clean, you know. Yeah, and and. A, Viruses don't like ammonia either, nor do bacteria, nor do like, so like if you're cleaning to the standard of the strongest thing, right? you're cleaning really good for all the other ones too. So hell yeah. I like all cleaning. It's fun. All right, Janet, where were we at earlier? We were talking about buying adult females. Oh, I, oh. how many intersex Crested geckos, have you ever seen or heard of? Because I've heard of two hermaphrodite crested geckos at this point that were sold as female, but so had weird. This this just got this just got brought up in a you know a group message on Instagram that I'm part of. Um, somebody in there, I can't remember what the issue was. Why? I can't remember what the backstory was, but basically, this animal. This crested gecko female has laid eggs and mm-hmm. has laid fertile eggs and they've hatched. Mm-hmm. But the animal was recently at the vet and I can't remember why. And I don't remember what they did, but this animal also has hemipenes. Mm-hmm. So it's a hermaphrodite, apparently. Yeah, I've heard about this a couple. I don't know if it's the same animal I'm also hearing about, but like, I just thought it was like, uh oh, if you're going to buy an adult female, you might want to like lift up the skirt a little bit uh make sure everything's anatomically normal and how often do you think they partheno because i hear about them parthenoing some amount it seems i have i haven't had any okay in my experience and it's a pretty large sample size but it seems like i'm the only one that ha- in the group of people that i routinely talk to that breed crested geckos i'm like the only one that has never dealt with a partho egg mm-hmm for whatever yeah. reason. People don't think about it in Crested Geckos either, that that would be a problem. See, but especially now that we have like more morphs, we're going to start seeing, seeing more of it because the, the that's what happened in Pythons. We were like, oh, well, shit. They're parsing like every five minutes. Right. And you that's, can tell because there's morphs stacking up. That's an, that's an interesting thing because you guys did the whole episode talking about whether you should dealing with the whole partho thing and ball pythons and whether that animal should breed and whether you should breed the, the offspring. Do the crested and, gecko people breed partho babies or do they like I don't discount know. the price or see I've the see I only seem to hear about oh I we found an egg. We have this female it's the only crested gecko we own and it's laid eggs. 
and they look fertile because you candle them and they got the little mm -hmm. Cheerio ring. It's like, hey, these are fertile. Incubate them until there's no debate, you know, and then they hatch. And then the it seems like with the parthos, the babies never survive or they don't right. thrive. Right. Because there's um, a lot of problems. I can't say that I have ever talked to somebody that said, hey, I had a partho baby hatch. I raised it to adulthood and then bred it. I mean, I have been talking. A, a, sorry, I, I'm like way excited about this for some reason. I saw a baby being sold as a the daughter of a partho. So they mother. actually labeled it. Yeah, on Morph Market. And I was like, because they were just doing like their lineage stuff. And I was like. Right, right. Huh. How often does that happen that like a breeder gets a hold of a partho mom and even bothers to keep get it up to size and breed it? Like see, it's right and see yeah getting a partho animal that hatches and then actually gets to adult size and then breeds again that you think that that's pretty rare i haven't heard a lot about okay. it yeah it seems like I what, haven't either. in the context of the partho stuff what I, what you always seem to hear about is they hatch but they don't thrive yeah All you right. know i've never it makes sense that, then that there wouldn't be that many if most of them Anyway, and I, I think I think the partho and crested geckos and even just geckos in general is way, way more common than like you would see in ball pythons or snakes, because you look at all the you look at morning geckos and all the other geckos that that's how they reproduce. You know, mm -hmm. they're just they're all females making clones of themselves. So we have a gecko person in the comments. Supreme Gecko. Look, we're that is, dragging them in. Oh, and that, forward motion's that, here too. So, yeah. Supreme Gecko, that is Wally Kern. He is just, he's an amazing, amazing Gecko person. He works with, I don't know, 40 or 50 species of Geckos. Something just crazy. He's bred probably 40 species in the last couple of years. Um, Can I have Japanese cave geckos, please? Supreme gecko, do you have some? I need them. He probably, he, I know he breeds cave geckos. I need them tonight. Japanese Com Comment please. below how many species you're breeding right now, <laughs> Supreme geckos. Shout yourself out. Um, and so, then Blazing Blue Tongues asked, said that we should have Warren Booth on. So I'm Warren Booth's tired of talking about it. I was just going to say, we've, we've talked to Warren Booth. He said that our episode is actually excellent. He actually watched it. And he's so over it, guys. Yeah, <laughs> like, he's bored. He's like over he's it. That, he's like, I've done that interview 50 times. Just go Don't watch need it to do it again. Else. He doesn't yeah, that, go on need. NPR. Go on NPR. Go right. back to the old ones that he's done. Those were great. They're great. That's where he's I learned everything about it. Yeah. He feels that it. there is nothing new to share. He loved our take on it. And the fact that we didn't ask him to come, <laughs> that we just referenced the information that he shared. Like he, right, guys, he has a great paper already. He's, a, he's, he's already, paper. Yeah. he's done what he, he wants to do on that subject. Podcast and that, wise. that blazing blue tongues, they're local. They're near me. Um, they live they're in the, I think if I remember right, they're in the St. Cloud area, which is about 45, 50 minutes from where I live, but they have just amazing blue tongue skinks, but mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that Wally Kern at Supreme Gecko, he just commented, he's bred over 125 species and he's kept, he keeps 50 now. Holy wow. smackerel. So I, here's, in addition to, word, that is amazing. In, in addition to the Crested Geckos, I also keep and breed the Periodora Picta, which I got my original animals from Wally. I also have. Hemidactylus tridurus, which is known as the termite hill gecko. How do you like um, those? I'm like very attracted to little geckos, obviously, because I'm into like cave geckos. The the hemidactylus, like the hemidactylus tridurus, they're the coolest thing to me about them is their scalation. It's like little pyramids. They're just so they don't have like tubercles like a turricus or whatever, but they have like pyramids. it's just like yeah, it's like a little pyramid bump. I'm into it. All right. They're so I, I always say they're like a leopard gecko, but like way cooler because they're all right. You're going to hurt our sponsors feelings. Shane Kelly. They're still cool to us because they're, I, you know, I keep them in, I actually keep my period or Picta and 
the hemidactylus, and then I keep also periodora stumphi, which is another Madagascan ground gecko. Um, there's a bunch more on the list with the periodora genus that I need to acquire, um, but space and time and all that good stuff. But I keep a lot of those, my ground dwelling geckos in basically like the V70 size tubs in a rack. Yeah. Do you keep in like, I'm assuming colonies? Yeah. That, okay. uh, I appreciate that, Wally. That's, um, <laughs> I looked at them on your Instagram. Let's get them up on the Instagram. The, uh, I just, uh, I, I absolutely love Wally because he will sit and talk geckos with you for hours and hours and hours. See right there. That, the trade is, that's is the, you know, the picta. That's a picta. That's one of my babies. What's the adult size? A little bit With, smaller than a leopard gecko. And how many can you, you keep in like a, a 70? I mean, 70 is huge. A little bit like a 28 quart. Could you keep like a one, three group in a 28 quart or FB4 I, equivalent? I, what I keep. So for breeding purposes, in my in the seventy quarts, I keep it. I there's usually there's two females in there, and then I rotate the males in and out because a male parrot or a picta, they are a little bit horny, and they will <laughs> hump everything. Yeah, and I they mean, will. Makes sense. They will. They will stop eating, and if they can smell a female, they want to hump and they don't want to eat. So, and they will literally. Yeah, so that's so a. This is the one pack. with the, the texture. Yeah, yep, that small. is. These that are really cool. That's five minutes old. There, I watched oh that thing gosh. hatch. That's amazing. I love watching them hatch because it's this little teeny tiny egg, and then they come out and they're these like giant things, and it's just it blows my mind. So What's the range around. of these ones? Is it still a Mediterranean? Uh, area? India, India, In Holy India. Smack roll. Wait, that's do I have fun. that? Do I have that? Yeah, India, I believe. And actually, if you want to get into the taxonomy and the nitty gritty, people say that they're not actually tridrous, that they're actually, I think it's pronounced Sangali. But mm -hmm. we just call whatever. them the hobby because we're dumb. I just I look at what Josh's frogs calls them and they call them tridrous, so it's good uh, enough yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have that problem in lots of species where like it got imported one way, we all kind of know it's not that, but then we have to so, like keep the, the mirage going. That picture there. Which one? On the left, kind of middle of the screen. That's, yeah, that's one of the. Look at those eggs. Oh, yeah, that's the that's the female. That's, that's my. So female. cute! I die inside. And those, so those eggs are like they're a little bit bigger than a pea. Do they're you incubate tiny. them in in? Uh, what is the gecko stuff that looks like Pangea hatch? Yeah. So, or do you the, do something? The custom? interesting, the interesting thing is about like whether it's this is what I do. Whether it's the right thing to do is whatever, but it works. It's something I learned from Wally. So, like the Periodora stuff, these Hemidactylus, they need the humidity of a substrate, but you cannot put the eggs on the wet substrate. So what I do is I use like a eight inch or 10 inch deli and I fill it, you know, an inch or two deep with Pangea hatch that is soaking wet. There's actually standing water in the Pangea hatch. Mm -hmm. And then I use milk caps or Gatorade bottle caps with dry Pangea hatch. And, and I set them on top of the wet and I set the eggs on the dry. So Tammy, at the very beginning of the podcast, had asked what your calcium protocol for egg-laying females is, and is it the same regardless if they are breeding or not, and what calcium products do you use? I think that was for Cresties, too. Yeah, but... this, yeah, for Crested Geckos. I, as long as you are feeding, and as we talked about in our kind of session we had earlier, Jessica, oh, yeah. this was the whole feeding thing. Um, wow, that's gorgeous. it's like a tiny uh striped like fat tail or something, right? Like it's yeah. that same vibe, but like tinier and more fun. Does that and make me a bad I person? Just, to me, <laughs> their their head is just obnoxiously large for their body size. 
Yeah. And their little, their legs are so, t- even as adults, the legs are so thin and so tiny. They just seem so fragile. But so the calcium, so what I do. Yeah, we should stay on topic. Just there, oh right God. there, there was a couple pictures there of how I incubate those things. If you want to pop that back up. Oh, uh, like, okay, I see. Yeah. So there's fresh hatched. Oh my gosh, there. that's so cool. <laughs> so you get an idea of how small those eggs are. Because that's a milk cap that those two eggs are in. Oh my gosh, do you get mad if your kids throw away the milk caps? <laughs> it's we save them and I have literally hundreds because I use them oh, for okay. water dishes too and food dishes. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um but for the, the calcium stuff for the crested geckos, um just in general, if you're feeding a, a commercially available crested gecko diet, so Pangea, Rapashi. Black Panther Zoological. Um, there's, what is it? Clark's. There's Big Fat Gecko Smoothie. Um, they're all prepackaged, the powder in the bag mixed with water. Everything is in there that they need. That your gecko will throt it. Well, it will live. It'll live 20 years, be your pet, be all good. But me as a breeder, for my adults, yeah, Pictor are the prairie dogs of the gecko world. They love to dig. <laughs> That's um, cute to me. Yeah, also. they're they're great. Um, I feed. So let's just. It's a it's a lot to unpack, but let's just breeder females, breeder female crested geckos during breeding season. So right now. In my room, it's in my basement. Ambient temp is like, oh, hold on a second. I, I gotta go. My dad just arrived, and I gotta tell him I'm doing this, and he's gonna want to talk forever. So I'll step away. Talk about geckos. Go geckos. Tell us everything. (laughs) I don't know anything about geckos, although I have looked into geckos. I really like the ones that that parts know to reproduce, and those little teeny tiny ones. Um. I also like the idea of them as feeders, but that's probably going to get me shot in this company. So no, what I don't know. The I little don't so. little day geckos. All right, lots of that things. Quick. He's back. He's back. Anyway, okay, so, good. We don't have to rely on my knowledge. <laughs> right now, this is just what I do. You can ask ten crested gecko breeders, and they're going to all give you different answers. Mm-hmm. Some breed year round. Some do a seasonal thing, which is what I do. So right now. In my room downstairs, in the basement, I'm in Minnesota. Today, the high is like 34 degrees. We're supposed to get snow this weekend. Um, But I have the lights in my room are on a timer. It's a mechanical timer. And from May until September, lights are on in the room 14 hours a day, off 10. So starting end of sep- beginning of October, so it's now been you know six, seven weeks into this, every week I decrease that photo period 15 minutes to a half hour. So by Christmas, I will be the lights will be on maybe nine hours and they're off for 15. And the room is cool and so for my, whether it's my breeder females, my adult males, adult females that are either not breeding or almost breeding or whatever, they're all in tubs and they're on shelving units that I have heat tape put on it with thermostats just to give the crested gecko a warm spot. And we'll get into the why I do that later. But so right now, my from now until February, ambient temp in my room will be... 70 to 72 and the reduced photo period, the reduced light cycle to cool everything down because the crested geckos need it. The Periodora need it and they're all fine and dandy. So right now they're not eating as much, but the females that are going to breed and are just either bred this year and then are going to be breeding next year or are going to be bred next year for the first time. They're being fed 
I feed all the commercially available Crested Gecko diets. I don't discriminate. I feed a lot of Pangea. I have a wholesale account with Pangea because I use that. To, I wow. use that to feed my colony. I was way excited also, about the wholesale account. <laughs> I, I, I use that for wholesale. Anything. I use that to feed my colony. Plus, I sell it. I yeah. have. I have a half a dozen other breeders that buy all their Pangea from me. So that's legit. But I'm feeding. They're, they're like right now they're only getting fed like every three days because they're not eating as much because they're cooling down. But what they're getting is like, I feed the breeders formula for Pangea, um, which has got a higher calcium content. Um, I also feed, there's a diet called the aerotonic diet. Uh, you, you buy the base, which is the powder base, but then you have to buy like the yo the yogurt and the fresh fruit and all this other stuff to add to it, to make it a complete diet. So it's basically kind of the best of the <sighs> best that you can feed a crested gecko. Um, and the geckos love it because it's fresh fruit. It's, you know, it's a great diet. Um, Ariel, but Ariel Kudia is the guy's name that does it. Aerotonic. He's on Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff under Aerotonic. A, a R R I T O N I C, I believe. And but anyway, he, does he have the recipe included on how you? Yes. So when you you buy the base for his food from him, and then it included in that is the recipe to make it the complete diet. Okay. So right now I'm feeding the highest quality food that has the high calcium content to build up their calcium reserves. So like with crested geckos, with the females in the roof of their mouth they'll have two calcium sacks mm -hmm. and you can, you, you can, there's a technique. You can grab a crested gecko, you hold it just behind the jaw and they'll just naturally open up their mouth and you can look at the roof of their mouth and see their calcium sacks. Or you can take like a plastic card, get it into their mouth to get it started open and they'll just instinctively open up for you. And or if you got to really drop their tails you get, while you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, they can, but you just got to know the animal and oh, okay. they're, but you'll, I have a lot of females that are pretty feisty that you just looking at them and they open their mouth and gape at you. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> um, women, you know, they smile at you. <laughs> it, it's, when, it's when they're, it's when their two brain cells get together and decide to be mm -hmm. angry, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, it was a good day when they were in agreement. On right. That day. So they're getting, the 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 crested gecko diet they're getting all the calcium they need but then um there's a, i don't add any calcium any of the powdered calcium any of that stuff to that diet cuz you throw the ratio out of whack too much calcium is just as bad as too little you know calcium but you do you still calcium your feeder insects to fix them or no Oh, the all the feeder insects are gut loaded. They eat better than I do. They're always <laughs> they're always eating. Yes. Gut, so you, you know, gut, gut load them, them. but yep, don't but don't powder them before you put them in there. Oh no, yeah, yeah. If you, okay, when you were tied to feeder insects, they get dusted. But just on the strictly the powder, the crested gecko diet. Do the, you add weird stuff to your diet like uh, whey protein or no? The uh, the one thing I or the. Spirulina I occasionally or whatever. will add bee pollen. Um, it does get it do, the aroma. I don't know if it's the aroma, but it does get a pretty good feeding response. Um, yeah. But I will buy. You can buy cricket powder or dubia powder mm -hmm. that I will occasionally add in. But especially on the Pangea side, because that's what I kind of use the most of. There like their fig and insect blend has a, you can actually see the chunks of the dubia roaches in it. Like you can see the difference. Right. So you shouldn't probably be giving that many. Insects. Right. So for the powder based diets, I don't add anything to it other than I just feed it as is. So they're getting a higher dose of calcium, fat and protein with some of, especially the breeders formula from Pangea. Mm -hmm. But with the, and obviously not all, but the majority of my breeder female crested geckos will eat insects. Um, and insects are absolutely required for breeding 
animals for breeding crested geckos. They need to be eating the insects that are dusted with calcium. Insects have to be gut loaded, obviously, but they need that because in the wild crested geckos, the fruit is seasonal. They eat a lot of fruit. They eat a lot of nectar, whatever. That's all seasonal. They eat a ton of invertebrate prey. There's, there's studies that they've examined the stomach contents of crested geckos. They found avian material in their stomachs. So mm-hmm. adult crested geckos are eating baby birds is what you learn from that. So they will eat. I have um, some of my crested gecko females that don't eat a lot of insects. I can get them to eat frozen thawed pinky mice. I mean, I'm not giving them a pinky mouse every week. It might be once a month or twice a month, especially just before Why do you breeding think season. That they wouldn't want to eat insects. Do you think there's like a palatability question? Do you think we should like candy coat crickets with like dupe like like Pangea powder? So it's I, I think they just they get lazy in captivity and they realize, hey, this human food monkey is gonna put this fruit <laughs> smoothie in a dish. And it tastes like watermelon or banana. And I can go over there and lap it up and then fall asleep and take a nap there. I don't have to, I don't have to chase a, I don't have to chase an insect or, you know, around my enclosure. Where's my room service, bitch. (laughs) How often do you feed feeder insects uh, to a non-breeding female, like a grow out or a non-breeding male or something like that? Grow outs, non-breeding, anything. (sighs) Babies, it's they're getting crickets, mealworms, waxworms, dubia roaches, black soldier fly larvae. Um, they're getting something insect at least three times a week. With That's the a baby, lot. Well, some people do once a week. Once, yeah, some people do once. Um, when like with a baby, the baby hatches. I make sure it's eating the pangea. It's pooping. Kind of, we're, you know, we got, we're going to, we know what we're doing. And um, once they're consistently eating the, the crested gecko diet, and I'll just say Pangea typically, but the crested gecko diet, once they're eating that and they're established on that, then it's, they're getting, for every time they get fed the crested gecko diet, they're getting fed insects at least twice. So they're getting insects three times a week. They'll get the Pangea, you know, t- twice a week. Um, That's almost some kind like of... double what some other people feed, though. Yeah. Do you ever feel like they're leaving too much Pangea in the cups, like leftover, and they're not getting their fill because they're full of bugs, and so they're not even trying to eat the Pangea? I or... I would rather have them full of bugs than full of Pangea. I think that's good because you're establishing that that they can eat bugs because a lot of people I've heard get crested geckos that won't eat any no, bugs. No, right. right. So having that exposure to, to babies, I think, is yeah. really important to help set them up for success in the future. And you're you're gonna get it's just in the wild, one of the first things a baby crested gecko is gonna eat is gonna be a bug. You know? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's- and they because the fruit is seasonal. So so my babies, especially hatchlings, up to 10 grams, it's probably 75% insects, 25% crested gecko diet. Um, Don't tell the pet people that. Keep this and a secret. <laughs> if you look at, like, so hatchling to 10 grams, it's like 75, 25. That 10 to 25 gram, it's probably 60, 40, 50, 50. Um, and as adults, it's probably 50-50, you know, if I can get it closer to that even 60-40, 70-30, where they're eating more insects, especially the breeder stuff, especially the breeder females. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's what they need. It's, they need way, way, way more insect protein than we've been like Probably wants everyone to believe. Right. Because right. they, right. like like, they never need any bugs is what you hear. As right. somebody that has no knowledge of crested geckos, other than like what I've gleaned, and you know, looking from various things, as they say, oh, this is a complete diet. You'll never have to have bugs. Right. I can, I I sell a ton of crested geckos that are going to pet homes. 
and it's hatchlings that are anywhere from five to eight grams. And I sell them for a hundred to 300 bucks a piece. And I tell the people, I said, this thing will eat every insect you put in front of its face. Awesome. But it will be perfectly fine eating the fruit smoothie, crested gecko diet, you know, if you don't want to deal with bugs, but I highly encourage it. I'm like, you can do this, but if you feed it bugs, it's kind of fun because you throw some crickets in there and that little baby, you're going to see it hunt and you're going to see that crested gecko do things that. It's good enrichment. If, if right. nothing else, like they just need the stimulation too. And if, if you're going to have a, a small number of crested geckos just as pets, you can tong feed them. You can tong train them and they will take crickets right off the tongs. And, you know, for that interaction with you, with your animal, because a crested gecko is pretty boring. It, it just wants to hide all day and sleep. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're not, they're not the most interactive of pets. Um, but I highly encourage the insect feeding and it's just because I want my animals. I want the babies well started and growing before I sell them. And that's why I feed the variety of the diets plus the insects. Cause they'll pretty much eat anything. Um, and for the adults, the breeder females, they need the bugs. They need that protein. They need the, the extra calcium from the dusting and they need all the nutrients that you get from gut loading them with, you know, carrots and butternut squash and um, collard greens and turnip greens and, you know, all the stuff, the veggie stuff that you want to, that the bugs naturally in the wild are getting all those micronutrients and the phytonutrients, the gut loading is super important. Mm -hmm. And that's all that, I mean, I buy, I go through thousands and thousands of crickets every week. I mean, thousands. And what people don't realize, I do not feed the common house cricket. They are the nastiest, most disgusting little thing on the planet. So full of parasites. A commercial cricket farm is a disgusting place. I buy my, there's a place locally here in Minnesota. They're in St. Paul. They are a food grade facility that raises crickets. Because, is that the one on snake discovery? Yes. Okay. Sorry. That's where I get my crickets from. Three cricketeers. So it is the, their crickets are for human consumption. They make chocolates out of them. They grind yeah. them up and sell the powder. You Do can, they have a website? Uh, I just think it's, I think it's three cricketeers.com. All right, let's go. Yeah. They sell I like think. chocolate covered crickets and yes. cricket protein powder that you can add to your like shake. Yeah. Of choice. Add to your smoothies. Yep. And that cricket protein powder, you can buy that and blend that into your crested gecko diet. So they're getting a large portion of, you know, insect protein from that as well. So yeah, that's cool. And, but how did, so, so they don't sell normally to the public no, live. No, crickets. no, no. They just they, sell the products. Yep. They you have to be on the DL, you know, friends the list. sweet <laughs> snake discovery friends list. That's right. Yeah. I've had uh cricket powder products before. They're pretty good. Um, kind of, I look at this way. Resistance in humans. You're, is- the live crickets I'm feeding are coming from that facility. They don't have parasites. Well, how does everybody else get this sweet deal of <laughs> parasite free crickets? You're going to hit up Richard on his Instagram well, account and he's going to sell no, you a colony. No, just kidding. Because there's if, like coccidian crickets and pinworms and horse There's all kinds of nasty stuff. Yeah. Really Ooh. cool but, stuff. <laughs> and I. I feed the band of crickets and band of crickets. There's cricket farms that deal exclusively with the band of crickets. They're a much better insect feeder compared to the common house cricket. What's the cost difference uh, in your experience? Like per thousand or something. Is they're, it more, they're way more, more expensive or similar? The bandits are more expensive. Um, yep. But I, there's places you can buy just the common house cricket. You can get them for nine bucks for a thousand crickets. You might pay 20 bucks if they're banded crickets. It's worth it not to look at a horsehair worm ever again. Yeah. The, the, rest the of parasite my life. factor. And I can buy, I can buy like you can get pinhead size banded crickets. Keep them in a, I keep them in a 66 quart tub. That's got some ventilation with egg flats. And they have the water crystals. Then I feed them veggies. And you can literally grow that pinhead cricket from the pinhead to the 
adult stage life cycle, they live a long time. So if you're going to buy bayonet crickets in bulk, my suggestion is you buy them smaller than what you want to actually feed them because you buy them smaller than what you actually want to end up feeding and you grow them because they'll live for, I can keep them alive for eight, 10, 12 weeks. Yeah. I mean, that's how people do dubious sort of too. Yeah. So like buy in a couple thousand quarter inches and just feed them off. And I have, I have a dubia colony. Um, Are you allergic that, yet? I think about that each day. Like when am I yeah, going to become I, allergic to something I don't even own yet? <laughs> I absolutely have developed the dubia roach allergy. Oh man, it sucks. But I wear a respirator when dealing with the dubia roaches because all I have to do is open the lid on the tub for the colony. If I don't have my respirator on, I instantly get shorter breath. Yeah, it's crazy. Right. I, I like they seem easy to to take care of colonies. Like it seems great, but like if you started to get really bad at it, you couldn't even feed it anymore cuz just like having it floating around the air would be too yes. much or whatever. So like the amount and of people I, who have mealworm allergies is atrocious too. Yeah. And I run a I run an air purifier in my gecko room because the dubia roach colony is in there as well. Mm -hmm. And that running the air purifier in there, it's the air purifier, and then right next to it is the dubia roach colony. Mm -hmm. So it the the stuff isn't hanging in the air. Um but yeah, otherwise, yeah. you know, because my like my bearded dragons, my Acumonter, they they'll eat dubia roaches till they explode. So blazing blue tongues is allergic, but just gets itchy. I'm just c concerned for my like I am not an allergy type Pokemon because I was raised on a farm, so I've licked all kinds of animals, gonads, and whatever as a child. So like I'm <laughs> I'm fine. But you know, these proteins are very novel and our immune system looks at them and is like, this is wild. I'm gonna have right. to go ahead and freak out about it in forever. A, in I have allergies anyway. I'm allergic to, you know, tree pollen and all that stuff and dust mites. And so I'm predisposed to be allergic and it didn't take long for me to develop yeah. that. Al so that maybe allergy. I'll be fine. then. I don't know. Like I, you know, you're a child, you like licking horses and stuff. It's, that's me buddies. But it's, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm fortunate. Salt lick with the horses. You don't I'm know what I did. I, have a friend of mine that, I did that um, as a child is what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have a I have a friend of mine that uh, he's a material scientist for 3M, which is based here in Minnesota. So he hooks me up with kind of the best of the best for the 3M respirators. All so, right, yeah, I mean, if keep doing it because you don't want it to like escalate like, with exposure right. or whatever. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. It, I if if you if you get anything out of this podcast for me, it's for the feeding aspect is. Feed those crested geckos insects. Just do it, you know, because um, they need it. It's it's vitally important. I need you to get some quill chicks, frozen thawed, and feed it to a crested gecko and send me if it eats it. Like, just but yeah, I want to see a little murder <laughs> demon in a tree, like raiding a nest of pre-killed. Like frozen. So thumb. how big is how big is a quail chick? Like, so a is button it... quail is the size of like a bumblebee, and then a quaternix quail would be like a couple grams. Oh, so they're like that. they're smaller than a day one pink. Yeah, yeah. I want to see a oh, crescent okay. gecko raid a little nest in like a its enclosure and just that would be so awesome. You need to do a reel. You have it. You have a homework assignment. <laughs> Obviously, we're good people, so. Frozen thaw pre killed, it's not going to suffer. Right. But I just want to see this crested gecko become the inner carnivore it was always meant to be. No, Didn't I work. just, it's they. I look at what I know now going into, you know, year number five for breeding. What I know now compared to what I knew when I started, it's just the stuff that I believe that is absolute 100% bullshit. Is that all coming from the top or is that coming from the pet people or is it just coming from? It's just, it's the, it's the general, it's the, the care sheet stuff. It's like, yeah, the basic information is good, but we need to do better. 
Because right, I'll tell you, nuanced enough or whatever. Right. Something else I'm doing. Um, if we want to have the UVB argument, which there isn't an argument, if you ask me, they say crested geckos don't need UVB. Every living thing on this planet benefits from UVB. It isn't going to hurt them, but they'll benefit from it. So they're the cool thing now. Is Jessica's you guys have probably heard of? Faith at you. <laughs> you, you, you oh, guys, you're about to get yelled at by Jessica. I no, can see I'll yell at my guess. What about UVB? You said uh, every living creature, and she's a scientist. Yeah, creature. that's a that's a Sith Lord statement. And yeah, we specialize you know in hunting Sith because you that's absolute. Are a biologist, because <laughs> I'll, you cannot I'll make an up. absolute <laughs> statement like that. <laughs> Most reptiles benefit from UVB, but you can't. Right, and then the, and then the creature, question is like, gonna die. if there's a, you know, serum, um, vitamin D goes up. What is the physiologically normal amount? And then like I don't know, because sometimes you can get that number in a crepuscular animal from like ten minutes outside or under a UVB lamp once a week, and so you can hit that number. So I think it, it's just like there's a function of dosing. Like, do, right. we wanna, do we want to accidentally give all of our crested geckos cancer, or do we want to expose them to UVB at, at a, in a hormetic amount that is actually good instead of on the other side of the bell curve, which is full so of cancer? I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what I'm doing. I This is completely unscientific. Major disclaimer. Mm -hmm. But so VivTech has their LED UVB bulbs now. Okay. And I bought a bunch of them. Because right. they're they're small, they're compact. I took crested gecko. Crested geckos typically lay clutches of two eggs every mm -hmm. twenty to forty days. Um. So, as those a clutch of eggs would hatch, the two eggs would hatch. I would take the hatchlings, separate them. One hatchling never was exposed to UVB. Other hatchling exposed to UVB, two hours a week. So uh, I would do in its enclosure or like in a special in a, in a, in a tub okay. in an enclosure. So I just I rigged it up where I had some tubs set up, cut the hole in the lid, put a screen vent, put the LED bulb on top of that. It penetrates enough, and so this was a very small sample size. I only did this with I separated. It was twelve clutches total, so twenty four animals. Twelve got UVB, twelve didn't. They got the UVB ball was on for one hour every three days. So they were getting two hours every six days, basically. Mm -hmm. The crested gecko hatchlings that were exposed to that two hours of UVB, their, their food drive, their appetite was un It was almost insatiable that mm -hmm. I had, I had crested gecko hatchlings that would, I could dump 20, you know, extra small crickets in their tub, it would eat every single one. If Did I don't that. hit some sort of weight milestone sooner than the other but, ones, like how long did this continue for? The thing I, I noticed is so you take, two, <laughs> you take a crested gecko, it hatches, it's eating, it's pooping, but it, 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 for three, four, six, eight weeks, it depend it, it looks like it's not growing. You could weigh it every week. And it, it's like it's not it hasn't gained a lick of weight. Mm -hmm. But then they hit a point where all of a sudden they start gaining weight and they start growing. Mm -hmm. The crypto gecko hatchlings that were exposed to that little amount of UVB, that kind of leg period where they were eating and pooping and not growing mm -hmm. would be cut from anywhere from a third to a half the time. So they okay. start putting on weight like at four to five weeks versus most of the other geckos that weren't exposed to the UVB, it was six, eight, 10 weeks before it seemed like they gained any weight. And this was totally unscientific, but the reason I did it is back October, 2019 at Tinley and ARBC, uh, they did the first annual North America, North American gecko symposium. And there was a, a young guy he might have been well. right out of high school. He might have still been in high school. He did a presentation. He worked with Ryan McVeigh, who at the time was with Zilla. He worked with him. Ryan got him some UVB bulbs. 
and he bred Leech Giannis. So this, this young guy, he ran an experiment and designed it, it he, and he presented this at the symposium about the effects of UV, UVB on the growth rate of Leech Giannis geckos. And it was, the difference was amazing. And it was actually a scientific experiment. He designed it. It was well thought out. I don't know if it would stand up to peer review, but that's a debate for another show. Yeah, but, usually sample size is the hard one. Because... Right, and it was a small sample size. Right. But it was, it showed in that, you know, <clears throat> he called it kind of that lag period where they finally seem like they're starting to grow was dramatically reduced by being exposed to the UVB. So I just picture a crested gecko, it hatches out in New Caledonia. It's in, you know, a temperate rainforest, more or less. And they're not getting blasted by like desert UVB type stuff, but they're being exposed to UVB. But more mm -hmm. often than not, they're hidden or they're doing the cryptic basking or whatever. But in the wild, they're exposed to that UVB. And so they're using it. And that's why all the diets, all the complete crested gecko diets, they have D3 added because they can't synthesize it, synthesize it on their own. Right. But it's, it's a huge debate that I know people, all their, all their new Caledonia stuff, crested geckos, lychees, gargoyles, the bavia, all the, the geckos from new Caledonia, they run UVB on everything. They're running like the 3% um, Arcadia shade dweller stuff on it. And yeah, you know, so so I don't. And they're wanna... they're doing it. They're doing it for two or three hours a day. Right. That that's that's where the rubber hits the road. Is like you have to be very specific that there is the benefit goes away when you give them cancer. So yeah. like you need to titrate it just right, and it probably doesn't even need to be two or three hours a day. Although that would probably be physiologically normal for them. Right. But if you did blood tests, you were like, like in humans. White people, bonus fact for everybody. White people are like, we're really good at synthesizing vitamin D with just like a face and hands exposed. Even at like a latitude where the sun isn't that direct, we can like sit outside in our like caveman mitts, get just enough vitamin D to keep going. And then that's actually enough. It doesn't even have to be very long. It could be like 15 minutes a week. Other skin tones, it takes longer. But we don't know what a crested gecko's like the, the response curve yet, I right. don't think. But I just want to like, they can obviously benefit, but I don't know if the benefits outweigh like the blanket statement of like, everybody blast your... She just worries that someone's going to take a UVB and stick it on <laughs> and the crest of the gecko. just turn it on all the time. All day, every... <laughs> that's, that's what... She's not saying UVB is bad. She's saying we need to be careful how, what we say because people right. will take that home and they'll buy a UVB and just stick it on all right. their... Which is they'll, what they're, some of the pet people are doing. It's they'll like a they'll buy a 14% UVB, UVB, UVB bulb from Arcadia and yes. stick it on top of their crested gecko tank and wonder why is my gecko now Dying. having like cataracts. <laughs> and, yeah, know. I mean, you saw the, I mean, you might not have seen it, but Sean Bradley did a, the, the interview of the vet. And he's like, I'm seeing more and more cancer because UVB is being used in geckos where it hasn't been and he's like we do see obviously blood serum go up but there's like a point where th there's more negative than good so i would honestly rather like encourage people to be like take your gecko outside on a nice day in like a safe space and let it interact outside when you do picture time or whatever and have 15 to 20 minutes of like natural uv at natural levels and then take it inside or if you're a bit or you're in minnesota and it's obviously a hell hole a hellscape <laughs> outside in the winter you do a yeah. uv like sunning tub wow you just uh <laughs> just on his home state there uh, sorry uh i was just scared oh, he's like it snows coming and i'm like winter's already here <laughs> well this is like october was abnormally warm like we haven't had a fall like this in several years where it was you know it was nice right up until halloween and kind of this first part of november has been okay but the shoe's gonna drop, and we're gonna go wow. into the winter, the winter hellscape here soon. But it's, I just I, 
I just I hate that it's all when or people or when when people talk about what a I don't care if it's a crested gecko, a ball python, a corn they the people that are reciting the people that are the loudest and that are constantly saying the same things, it's all the stuff from the care sheets. You know, like I, I'll be vending a reptile show or at a reptile show talking to somebody that's a vendor that I know that has crested geckos and people will come up and go, they'll be talking to the people that were like, Oh, these are crested geckos. They need this, this, and this, and they don't need this. And they're so easy. And I just, I want to just shake my head and be like, there's yeah, so but much you have to se- like convert the sale. Right. So like you have to right. pre- pretend like they are a plug and play species, which they kind of are, but like, obviously they're always going to be more complicated than that because secretly they want to eat. Uh, chickens um. right <laughs> and even you have the customer coming up to your table like i've had it happen where i'm vending and they'll come up and they'll you know i'll greet them and we interact and we start talking and they're like oh yeah i'm really i want to get a crested gecko or i have a couple of crested geckos i want to buy more i want to start breeding whatever it is and then they start reciting all these things that they've read off of a care sheet and or they'll take something that they've read off of a care sheet or somebody's told them and they'll repeat it to me. And a lot of times I just, I want to, sh- I have to bite my tongue and cause it's they're what they're saying is completely incorrect. Yeah. And when I tell them how I do things, they look at me like I have two heads and I'm a moron and they walk away sometimes mm-hmm. because I say, this is what That's I my do. Life, mostly. And they're like, no, this is what you're supposed to do. And I'm like, I, it's just, you know, you have a, a job, t- technically, but is this like mostly your full time gig now, or how no, is that no. split going? Okay. No, this is. So I'm a CNC machinist. Um, That's a I have skill. a great. I have a great job. Um, you could kidnap me, throw me in a van, and dump me off in any state or city in the country, and I'd be able to find a job within a day or two. Cause I have, I have marked. Well, why skills. are you still in Minnesota? <laughs> we're, we're in, we're in demand. Um, You're in Oklahoma B. So shut God, up. <laughs> I'm married into this tragedy. Isn't it like a hundred anyway. degrees there still in Oklahoma? It just became fall recently. So is this no, it isn't a hundred now. So that's okay. Well, cool. you two talks amongst yourselves. I've had three kids, so I'm going to go pee. Uh, Cause nice. you're down, you're like in like the Southwest part of Oklahoma, right? Yeah. The part that's like halfway on the road to being a, a desert. So it's, yeah. still, it's still a grassland, but we're, you know, a hundred miles away from like mesquite scrub. Or I mean, whatever. it's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to blab on here. I, I'm, I know which air force base your husband's stationed at. So oh, I do too. Yeah. I know the area you're in. Yeah. It's but not yeah, that it, fun. Uh, it's fine. At least it's not Fort Sill. Which is uh, Fort Fort Sill's probably better. Let's be honest. I don't mean to rag on the army people that much. No. <laughs> but no, it's I. So yeah, I'm a CNC machinist. I have a great job. Um, the the where I'm at now, I started there in January. I've bounced around. I bounced around my job, my career. I bounced around a lot of different places mm-hmm. because it's one way. Right now in this area. For people in my field, if you're not working, it's because you don't want to. If I could clone myself, my clone could have another job tomorrow. So you we don't want in- the Crested Gecko work to like replace the CNC well, work, or do you like doing both? Or I'm just trying to get into your, like what's your I, goal? What's the five year goal? Well, Richard? my my ten year well, so or I'm four I'm four years into my ten year plan. Let's put it that way. Right. So I'll be fifty in six years. And I said, I want to be able to do geckos and do whether it's geckos at the time it was geckos. Now it's like, Hey, there might be some snake stuff. There might be some other stuff. Mm -hmm. But I said, by the time I'm 50, I want to be able to either quit machining or dial it back to like Mm part-time and be more focused on the gecko thing and the business. And the way I've been doing things the last couple of years, basically doubling production every year is like, okay, this is what I got to do to get to my goal. So this year, 2022, um, just crested gecko hatchlings were going to be over 500 animals. 
which is your in- market is pretty empty. So that means you move them at shows, or you wholesale um, some of them and move the, some of the shows, or the what I've tapped into is the wholesale thing. Okay, I hundred oh, percent moved... wholesale, or, or no, no, I I produced a lot of stuff this year because I kind of got lucky and like females that I didn't think were gonna produce or you know i just i'm like oh whatever i've got you you're ready to breed you've been laying infertile eggs let's pair you up mm-hmm. i just i got lucky where um i averaged probably i'm somewhere between 14 and 15 eggs per female this year which is insane i had like 15 maybe 16 females that laid 18 eggs which is that's it's a lot that's, that's cra- corn that's, snake numbers <laughs> that it's crazy because you talk to a lot of people their crested geckos are laying you know in a in a 12 month span they're laying 12 14 eggs is a high number and you attribute like that to like to the insect food um i attribute it to a lot of things how i manage the room how my kind of my my breeding procedure that i do now that's what i attribute it to um and controlling what I control. Um, but yeah, I had, it was a, it was a banger of a year and I have, I'm, I'm like, it was like 12 weeks ago, eight, 10, 12 weeks ago. I was at a point I'm sitting in my gecko room after just cleaning. I had spent between a Saturday and a Sunday, I had spent about 26, 28 hours cleaning, feeding, doing stuff. And I'm sitting there after I did all this work and I thought, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> I was like overwhelmed because my pick, I, I produced way more picta than I thought I could possibly produce this year. It mm-hmm. was crazy. And the Crescent geckos, just everything went bananas. And I thought, what am I doing? Do I, I wanted to double production from last year to this year. And I'm like, if I double it next year, that's a thousand geckos. What am I doing with my life? And Where, I, are they in a particular project or are they just like so stuff my, that's mostly pet when quality I, or whatever anyway? When I started, the thing that immediately caught my eye with crested geckos was the Dalmatian, super Dalmatian stuff. Okay, um, so you just have like is that what you're mostly focused? I see like Harley stuff. And- yeah, so I'm I was focused on the Dalmatian stuff. But what I've realized purely from, if you want to talk Fine. business, the financial, business, yeah, if we want to hear about the industry and business. The, yeah, we're the, almost finishing up. So we're trying to get all of your money. Talk. Yeah, the, the, the business financial part, what I quickly realized is I can have two of the most amazing looking super Dalmatian male and female geckos, ha- breed them, get babies, and have babies that. I know are going to be spectacular as adults. Mm -hmm. They're going to look like their parents and they're worth a lot of money. But to try and convince somebody looking at a five gram gecko with not a ton of spots that it's going to look like this gecko that its parents are. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm paying $500 for this little five gram baby or a thousand dollars for this 10 gram sub, you know, juvenile. That's a hard sell to, you don't have a warehouse of, space to grow up every single baby to 30 right. grams and so it's like to convince which is like the that, new strategy or whatever to like right hold, to, not new but you know what i mean like hold everything back and then like price them aggressively right. as adults i just don't have the room for that so it's right. like i'm like if i want to make amazing super dolls i've got to have other stuff that right out of the egg they look amazing they have pattern the harlequin stuff the pinstripe stuff yeah whatever it is do you think a, a show, baby Harley sells better to like a normal human at yes, a pet, pet 100%. show than this any uh, like a even like a phantom? It's probably really boring to look at. Like I love phantoms. I told you this earlier. I'm so yeah, boring. Cool. I can't imagine how boring I am to myself. I'm like all oh, the world of geckos, and I'm just like I want a dark one that's patternless. Right. You put <laughs> if you take ten crested gecko hatchlings that are five grams that are really nice extreme harlequin harlequin pinstripe stuff quad stripe something whether it's color pattern contrast that just pops that looks really nice as a baby 
you put those 10 geckos next to 10 of my best hatchlings from my best super doll projects, you put them on a table, price everything the same, the 10, the, the super doll stuff is going to sit. Nobody's going to buy right. it. But super doll pen... is nice, especially when it gets big. Are right. you, are you more into like the, the ones that fire down like white and are you like pale yellow or do you like the into reds or what is your favorite version of a super doll? Um, all of them. All of them, he says. I okay. My I, my I have best. A Go ahead. Sorry. My best stuff that I have right now will be red base with red base with re red spots. So I have a question, and I couldn't figure it out in like the ten minutes when I looked it up. Not all, obviously, not all black dolls have red spots too. So, do you actually, in your opinion, believe that? the black dowel gene and the red dowel gene are actually separate genes because sometimes they operate independently and sometimes they don't. Or do you think it's a modification of the black gene where another gene is coming in and like saying, Hey, can you produce some red and green dots also? Thanks. What do you think? I, I honestly think that there is more, there are multiple genes that even just control Black. the dalmatian Gosh. trait okay i think it's multiple genes and because i've got animals because you have the you have the little tiny black spots that are like dots mm -hmm. you have the big ink blots mm -hmm. and you have everything in between and then you have what they call like the oil spots which it's a black spot but it's like faded and you yeah. can have an you can have an animal with all of them and then you have you know, you've got now the red red spots are super hot now, and mm -hmm. like the red ink spots. What's are the just, nice um, one? Uh, blood splatter, the one that's like the splatter line from uh, uh, the Kenny at yeah, yeah, Kenny. Yeah, I should look it up, Jana. Do you know what, he, what any of this is that we're talking about? Splatter line. Nope. All right, I'll show. I mean, Jana I know what a, a Dalmatian is. Yeah, but all the other words you guys have used. Nope. But yeah, it's, it's okay. for it's the spots is what brought me into the gecko thing. But now looking at it, business, financial stuff. You I prefer can, it on a phantom or on like a like, the, like a pattern so that you could sell the babies to the people who don't care. You know, I hate I, mean? I hate I hate Dalmatians that have pattern. Okay. Strong statements. I, you heard I, it here first. <laughs> I want the clean base, like the alt to me, the ultimate super Dalmatian gecko is a ultra clean yellow base with the giant ink spots on it. That's like the ultimate thing. And you know, then, and you're going to, but you're going to do it in like pink. So you're just kind of try to hypo out a red base. Well, I have, I've got spots. yellow stuff too. I've got oh, it all. Okay. all right. So, but, but, the ultimate for me is the clean, really clean yellow base, no pattern that fires up a really nice, like bright yellow with the contrast of the big black ink spots. Kind of the next level would be a, like a light, like almost pink colored gecko, really light red base, super clean with either the big red ink spots or just red spots in general, or that same gecko with just lots of black spots. I just, you put spots on it, I'm probably going to like it if it's He's got a clean it. Bait. Yeah, I think they're very charming, and it's a great project. And Are there pictures on his Instagram? Can we? Yeah, let's just do and that instead the, of... The uh, other thing, too... I was for trying so, to find uh, Blood Splatter. For so I, long with the Crescent Geckos, especially some of these, like the Super Doll stuff, they're breeding for the spot size shape amount whatever and kind of structure has gone by the wayside <laughs> so yeah. i have uh, some like there's those are some animals that i produced so they've got like the top one there has the lighter there those two geckos are fired up so that's the brightest that they're going to be that top gecko 
that to me is a really nice gecko because it's that it's a light red base. It's got the black spots. It's got red spots, and it's got decent structure. That's a nice <laughs> gecko to me. Um, the mother of that picture, the female that produced that, Valeria, she's an almost pink color gecko. But like the picture, that one right there, that this yellow one? gecko that I've got in my hand. Look at the crests on that, how they droop over. Mm -hmm. So that gecko, his name is Lemon Poppy Seed. He's here on loan. I'm doing a breeding loan with him from with another local breeder. He's a big gecko. He's got a big droopy head. So I've got some females that yellow base with nice spots that don't have the best structure. So mm -hmm. we're going to put him to those females to, it might take a couple generations, but to improve the head structure of these geckos. Cause I want to produce super clean yellow base with lots of spot coverage with big giant heads. So, so obviously these are more high end project. Are you going to, you know, obviously you wouldn't wholesale these ones. Are you going to no. hold like grow up these ones to, to determine quality and maybe yes. get, a, get a loop for pores and I, price them yep. appropriately for morph market? Most of my most of my super doll project stuff that's all being held back. I hold back everything until I can kind of figure out and then sell off what I you know whatever if I too many males whatever. Hold back for life. <laughs> but the there's a hold the back rack in every species. Deep yeah, the reason I got into like the harlequins and the pinstripes and the quad stripes, I really like a quad stripe crested gecko. I just me too. Me I too. love it's like a phantom with stripes. Especially if it's a dark base. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Dark base with a contrasting color for the quad stripes. That's I love it. But Especially when it comes up and it will fringe. So it's it's like a I don't know, a shitty sable or something. Like a but it's that that idea of like a dark linear. Yeah. It's sort of and like the, a tri stripe ball python, to be honest. The the quad stripe, the harlequin, the extreme harlequin, the pinstripe stuff. That stuff, the babies sell so much better at shows and wholesale. Like I wholesaled just, I went from having, um, I have 16 sea serpents racks. They're the 45 tub rack. They're six quart tubs, 45 tubs in a rack. I had 16 of them. Full, That's a lot. Full. <laughs> That's of a babies. lot. And oh now I, God. now I have, like, those racks are empty because I wholesaled everything there. So that's another. That's one of my bamboo rats. That's a polker. So this guy right here, that is his name is Blotch. Um, he's a red base with red spots. I think there was a question. Oh, how much do you outcross um, for you personally? Like, would you breed? Geckos that shared a grandparent or I've done because you like I've, bought it from other people or whatever. I've done some line breeding, um, doing, you know, daughters back to fathers or, you know, sons back to mothers. I've done some select line breeding, but mm -hmm. I have a lot of geckos that are completely unrelated. A lot of my stuff is completely unrelated. And like these, th these three geckos here, it's a couple lily whites and then another super doll that I bought. That's some recent additions. So I'm oh. getting in the, I'm getting into the lily white stuff. You're getting into I'm the, just, I'm, the morph stuff. From the business side, like right there, that picture there with you were just on this the one? red and yellow gecko with the eggs. That was one of my best super doll pairings from this year. And you held everything back, right? Yeah. Until you figured out. Gender. I, I, I've got, I've still got eggs in the incubator from her. Um, I sold him just because I received an offer that I couldn't refuse, but, mm -hmm. and I've made, I've, I've got babies now that I know are going to be as good, if not better than he was. So I've already got replacements in the pipeline. Plus I've got a couple of his brothers. So I've got a lot of that blood that he's from, but I just, as I've gotten into this from the business side and looking at doing this long term, I got to have, you got to have a little bit of everything. Right. You have to have stuff you can sell at shows and stuff you can wholesale and yeah. stuff. It's a personal project that's high end. Yeah. That makes sense. I, you know, so and, have you produced Lily Whites or just bought them 
I have not produced any yet. No. Yeah, I was I wondering would... if you knew, like obviously Lily Exotics explained like the neuro rate that they saw was like five percent, but I've heard other people say it's as low as like three percent. Um, so I was wondering what your percentage was. Yeah, I haven't, and see, and that's the thing because Lily White's exploded, and it was like, okay, this is a gene that we can actually work with and we've identified, mm-hmm. and. Now you talk to people that are really into the lily white stuff. There's a lot of really low end, low quality, poor structure lily whites out there because Mm -hmm. everybody hears the word. It was, you hear the word lily white and you dollar signs start flashing in your head. So, and it's what we're seeing now with the caps and the fraps and the sables and the exanthics and, you know. All right. Of all those, which one's your favorite personal taste time? Go between exanthic, frap, Cap and Lily White, as far as like the premium. Oh, premium. the higher end geckos. Yeah, which ones of uh, is the one that you're most excited about right now? It'd be the really, really nice Lily Whites. Okay, like, so they've had more time to work. Than, right. Yeah. You know, it's there's a there's a pretty um, well known mm-hmm. red Lily White female named Scarlet. Um, it's owned by. I actually don't know his real name, but it's MPB something Cresties, but it's a really nice red lily white. Um, she she's a nice animal, and it's then you look at some of the stuff that like, um, like, uh, Creptiles is producing, and just some of these ultra ultra high end lily whites that you look at it and go, that can't be real. It just, it's amazing how nice they look. Um, you know, just the high end Lily white stuff with the super high coverage, the super high white coverage. Um, Isn't there a point though, where like some of them are so white now that it, they need to like dial it back to 80% again. Cause I've seen like almost a hundred percent white, you know, high white lilies. And you're like, right. we made a white one. Come back, bring it back. So, like, I'd See, rather I, almost have 80 or 90 so you could get some contrast. Right. Yeah. I'd like some color in there, whether, I, you know, red or yellow. Red just looks so nice. Yeah, on red's a really white. But, yeah, I just I'm, – I'm getting into a little bit of everything just because that's what you need to function as a business and be able to produce stuff that will sell as babies. And, um, you know, it's just – there's – we're learning so much now more and more about the actual genes that control all of these traits. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, you got the sables, you know, there was a sable that was at Tinley up for an auction at a table that it went for 20 K, you know, for, it was like a five gram hatchling. It was tiny, but it was a sable and it's new. So that's the big thing. I mean, they look nice. They look. Yeah. Exanthics go for big money. Um, yeah, but and the cappuccinos and the super caps and that whole debate, those go for big money, and it's that part seeing the morphs in these genes that we know we can reproduce in crested geckos, and the money that they're worth, it's gonna bring people in that are just doing it for the money, and it's gonna screw things up. Mm-hmm. Um, How do you feel it, about the thing that happened at the Vegas show? with bringing in the Japanese buyers, Korean, Korean, Korean buyers. It's the Korean crested gecko market is insane right now. Like they, there were many, many, many Korean buyers at Tinley in October buying every, anywhere from sub adult to adult female crested gecko. They could get their hands on like so those to, ones that don't, color up till they're older how come you're not more marketing them more towards the korean market i just i've i've so i haven't sold any to korea i've had people inquire you know korean buyers contact me but i just i'd love to tap into that market because they know what they want and right. they're they spend the money um it's just that's kind of I don't know. I don't know how to break into that market. Um, Learn Korean and um, <laughs> work at a Korean barbecue, and well, then learn I, the secret 
Crusty Gecko handshake. I see that you have a picture of uh, high de desert pythons on your Instagram. Maybe you should shoot him a message because wasn't he friends with the guy that that happened to? Oh, the the big sale at in Las oh, Vegas. Oh, flawless Crusty Gecko. Mm -hmm. Well, Crazy. it was the it was Brian Butler at Altitude Exotics that did the four hundred k. Oh, why don't you message him? Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it, okay. He's he, is he too he, famous to be like approachable i guess it's no he's not you know he, I mean? he was at Tinley in october and i talked to him you know oh. very briefly but um it's yeah there's like there's a there's a couple guys here there's one guy that lives in the same town that i work in just you know 20 minutes away he's a lychee breeder and he's got the korean buyers just you know all up in his dms on instagram wanting to buy stuff and there was Korean buyers at his table at Tinley that just, they wanted to buy everything wholesale and they have a price in mind, oh, but okay. his stuff, he's, he goes, I'm not going to sell it for that price. You know, <coughs> if they're, they're worth more than that. So he's holding on to stuff because he has some amazing leeches, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, they were, it's the yeah, first it's time. It's definitely robbing Peter to pay Paul to like wholesale too much stuff to a different country to then like out compete you in that stuff. Right. You know, right. like leopard geckos, no offense, leopard gecko people, all of the Korean leopard geckos are better. They just are better. They pick the best ones from all over and now they're doing better than. Right. Uh, just in terms of selective breeding, like really nice tangs, really nice, whatever. They're just better. I, I don't know what to do about it, but it's okay. I mean, I like Koreans. I like Korean barbecue all day. I mean, that's just that's that's where the market is exploding. And this is the this is the first time I've been at a show. It's the first time I've seen the Korean buyers at Tinley like they were. The yeah, I just didn't realize they were asking wholesale prices. So that's yeah, that's there, a different there animal. Was, there was there were some that were looking to do big quantity wholesale. Then like that was on the lychee side, and then there were um there was like the ones, the crested, the ones that were buying crested geckos, they just didn't care what the price was. Oh, okay. You know, like, it seems like if this is something you're planning to, to continue to do at mass quantities and the U S market doesn't quite understand the pricing that they should be at. And the Korean market does it just makes sense for me business wise to tap into that. Right. And I think the, in the U S with the way the market is, if you've got good stuff, it's going to sell. Okay. You're going to be, you're, you're selling to other breeders, just like the ball Python people. There isn't, right. people aren't buying a $20,000 ball Python as a pet. Hmm. You know, it's, you're selling to other breeders and I've got like the super doll stuff. That's what I'm going to focus on. going to be the high end stuff for that breeder market. But I have to have the other stuff to make it a viable business. Right. And if you do the math, I always tell people, so let's say you want to sell $100,000 worth of reptiles in a year. You have to sell one animal for $273.97 every day of the year. Mm -hmm. So that's a $300 and basically a $275 animal. You have to sell 365. It's a lot. So a you lot. said in the last, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, yeah, I, you, you I, averaged I, $300 for a... If, if I produced with what I did this year um, and I've actually, I've got eggs in the incubator that once they hatch, the animals are sold wholesale already. So I've got that lined up, but I sold like 350 geckos wholesale to several different buyers. And the average I'm getting a little bit higher than average price for the wholesale because they know what they're getting. They're nice animals. And, you know, I don't know what they're doing with them, where they're going, but they, they were paying me more than the average wholesale. I was averaging about $65 wholesale on those animals. That's pretty good. But, yeah. you know, with what the other animals I sold this year, you know, my average selling price, it's been about 300 bucks. And I'm going to do, I'm going to do somewhere between 80 and $90,000 this year. 
That's but, not shabby. <laughs> but, but I've spent, I've spent every bit of that and more, you know, to take care of what I've got and to buy racks and the stuff I need to care for the amount of animals that I have. So yeah, I'm as a business, I'm going to lose money this year, but I've generated more revenue than I ever have before. Oh my but gosh. I, you have to say your cat's name. I know. It's my favorite in the back. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. She's been sitting up behind me here. That's Maisie. Maisie. Oh, right. shut up. just had to get herself on the internet. There's a yeah. question in the comments that we should pop up once you're done with your thought. I'm sorry to interrupt you. She was, but yeah, it's, what was I've, the I've generated more money this year than I even thought possible. And that it's because I produced a lot of animals and I wholesaled a lot of stuff, but, and I've sold, um, our, our Rulio is, uh, oh, offering to help you learn Korean. No, he's saying if you need a contact that knows both, if yeah. you want some help, just message him and him. Right. AJ, I'm assuming him. Um, I, will have, I will have to take you up on that. But yeah, you can, I have, I've generated a lot of money this year and it's, I hate to say it, but some of the money that I've made with Crested Geckos this year, I, I'm now Not involved. Geckos? No, I'm now involved with somebody breeding ball pythons. So, whoa, it's okay. They, ball pythons are fun, dude. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I have zero to do with it. Oh, I just, just invested. I just handed them some money to, so they could acquire some animals. And I'm hoping at some point I will recoup some of that investment and it'll be some cash flow for me so I can dump it. I can buy more stupid geckos with it, you know? How come it, he's not giving your daughter a snake? What the I mean, heck? I really will, but yeah. Well, yeah, well, Here, I'll, I'll, be probably, right I'll probably end up with, you know, it'll be a, oh, no. a, a DG clown leopard something or another as a, oh, as a okay. pet. They're not pet qualities. They're no, this is, this is you know, double visual recessive with three, okay. four codons tacked so and potential. Are you a hit. silent partner or you want to shout them out or? Totally silent. Silent. Okay. This person has zero social media presence. Oh, okay. That's um, good. But he's like, we produce these snakes. We'll have, we won't even have to work to sell them. I'm like, sounds fine to me. He's, it's a very, it, he's, it's a very small boutique collection. You know, oh, he's worked. Yeah, that's the high end stuff. That's what you want. Is the he's working on the like triple visual, even you know quadruple visual recessive stuff is what he wants. That's the end goal. Yeah, and he's and got he's got some triple visual stuff now. So oh, that's you know, awesome. Yeah, it, it's what everybody's chasing. But yeah, just from the business side, I've also learned that you got to diversify. You got to have something more than just one species. I mean, I've got the picta geckos. I've got some of these other geckos, but I've gotten into the snakes. You know, I've got the mandarins and I've got, you know, the, the Yunnan mountain rat snakes, the bamboo rat snakes, the broad banded rat snakes. It's all that, the, the Asian rat snakes, um, por you know, Oreo cryptophis porphyracea, you know, there's, Have have you broken it down? You wholesale a baby for about 65. Have you broken it down at what your production cost is to produce one baby? I think in the podcast a couple of weeks ago, I threw out in the chat. I said, I said something like 20 bucks. Oh, okay. That's awesome. And the, the more I think about it. Cause your females are producing more than an average female. Right. So your, it, your numbers are actually smaller, should be smaller than other people's. Like if I looked at it, um, if I looked at it this year, cause I bought so much equipment, so many racks, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of racks. If I factored in the price of the racks and everything I bought this year to house everything I produced, my cost is probably a little bit higher. But if I look at next year, what it would cost me to produce a baby gecko, then to wholesale it at say 50 to 60 bucks. Right. I'm probably going to be 14, $15. That's awesome. You know, because these are animals, they hatch, they're hatching out at two, let's say two grams. And I'm selling them at four, five, maybe six grams. And I'm, they're only from the time they hatch, to the time I wholesale them and ship them, 
they're 12 to 16 weeks old. So, you know, you know, you count, it's a, it's a, you know, less than a penny, a cricket and things like that. And you factor in the food, the true cost to get one from hatchling to wholesale and shipped is probably 15 bucks, you know, um, it's, that's one thing I I'll probably, it's just another thing I'm going to add to my list of stuff I'm going to do to data that I'm going to keep track of for next year. Cause I have an entire Excel spreadsheet where I track my females, how many eggs they lay. And I have the spreadsheet. It's actually Google sheets, but I have it set up. I punch in the date where I, the eggs were laid, punch in the next clutch. And then it tells me the days in between clutches. And then it, calculates the average days between clutches um i've got a whole bunch of data that i've been collecting now for the last couple of years and this year a lot of my success has been because of that data that i've collected the two previous years and just tracking trends with females and how many eggs they're laying okay. and i've got kind of a baseline and i'm hoping to get where my baseline average eggs per female per year is like 16 eggs. That's eight clutches. If I can average that, that's you're I'm killing it, you right. know? Mm -hmm. And I've had, I, you know, it's, I typically, if that I, I start off, I've got everything separate. I have no males with females right now. So in another month between Christmas and new year's, I'll start my first wave of pairings will happen. And so from I'll pair between around between Christmas and New Year's, I should have eggs laid in lay boxes and in the incubator by the end of January. And then like so I have some males that are going to go to hopefully four or five females next year. And they go in with the female between Chris, the first one between Christmas and New Year's. They're in there for a week to 10 days. And then from Christmas to J the end of January, hopefully I've rotated them through all their females. And then he'll go back to that original female that he was with the first time. And for, from January, from that, from basically the Christmas to the end of February, he, that male will be rotated through all of his females at least twice. And hopefully I will have fertile eggs from all those females that he, they were, he was paired to. But then I will put them back in just to get that extra lock because a crescent gecko will retain sperm for 12 months. Mm -hmm. So she only needs to be locked once or twice and she'll lay for the next 10 to 12 months. And sometimes they'll lay eight or nine clutches in a row, take two months off and lay again and they're still fertile and it's still the sperm from that previous male. Now so, – what is a species that you're drooling over that you don't have that you would love to add to your, to your business? Not a, um, more, a species, a whole new species. Well, I got to get my, this is the dog. This is Luna, the black lab making up here. <laughs> Hi Luna. Um, I'm working on, I want to have at least a 1.2 of the, it would be, Polker, Coxi, Latticinctus, and Volante, which are the kind of four common bamboo rat snakes in the hobby. Okay. <clears throat> and then I want to have like a 1.2 of the Mandarin rats. Um, maybe get into some of the locality Mandarin rats. Um, uh, what is it? Japanese forest rats are on my radar. Um, as far as snakes. Um, what about <laughs> Japanese rat snakes? What the I was heck? Just gonna dude? say, oh man, you didn't say Jessica's favorite. <laughs> what the heck? I know they need a, a little hotter, but they're so much better looking than Japanese. I saw rats. some at Tinley. Uh, New Moon reptiles had. They were Japanese forest rats, but they were red. They were so red. Yeah, they have like a red face, and they have like a poopy brown face, but. Yeah, they were they were beautiful, and mm -hmm. they weren't cheap. I mean, but they were beautiful snakes. Um, I've got so I currently have the the two Periodora species. There's about 
six more of those that I want to get my hands on and work with. Um, there's, I, from a business point of view, I should probably get into gargoyles at some point, but yeah, I've heard for, for show wise, people haven't been able to move cresteds and could still move gargs like in the last couple months when things were getting weird recently. For like your, what I, what I call in, this is in my area in Minnesota and even in Wisconsin, the people that I know that vend more shows than I do, the market for your hundred dollar to two hundred dollar crested gecko is bananas right now. You almost can't have enough of them. I saw what I heard at all, like or saw at the show that I went to. But it, it's like nobody not, cares about crested geckos. Like, but if you have a garg on a crested gecko table, they'd be like, and right. that's a hundred dollars. They'll be like, that's different. It's just yeah. different. <laughs> but it's like the but, same thing, but different. But it's like, yeah. um. I haven't vended a lot of shows this year because um, I have another breeder that's local to me. She actually bought her first crested gecko for me and now she's breeding and she's got the whole business and she's taken it to the next level. She has bought a lot of stuff for me wholesale and mm -hmm. it's like, she can't get enough of it. I'm like, how many more do you need? You know, cause she's selling 20 geckos a show. And, awesome. and this fall it, still like post inflationary problem yeah i i you know i don't like know the what... spring was happening everywhere as far as i can tell yep and she's it's done well okay. the last the last couple shows she's done she's All done right. well that's good um oh, she's a winner but it's i think that's the thing you go to like the the cold-blooded shows you know they do shows all over kind of the midwest and even down into like the oklahoma area i think mm -hmm. they're based out of kansas city if i remember right but Maybe they do four shows a year here and the show coming up here in November. And I think it's not this weekend, but the following weekend, there might be four or five or six people there selling crested geckos mm -hmm. and she'll be there, but she still does. But okay. She'll sell more crested geckos by herself than the other four or five vendors will sell combined. Well, did they smell like, what is their problem? <laughs> no, it's because she has, she, she's nice. She right? has, she has a nice logo. She's got nice display. She's got nice. She's got the show set up dialed. Okay. Plus she has, she has all kinds of merch. She sells paint. You know, she sells food. She sells ledges. She sells food cups. She's right. got, you can go buy and she sells the bins. So she sells a ton of babies either that she produced or that she got for me wholesale. And she has the bins with everything in there you need for that. Little oh, baby so she gecko. sells like a little starter kit yep. just so they don't. Yeah, she, that's always a good idea if you can do it because then you like you don't have to over explain it. You're like, this cost, this is the cost it cost me. So here, buy it at cost right. and try not her, to fuck up. <laughs> her business model is working and she's killing it. All right, um, cool. So, would you she, recommend people get into crested geckos even with? I don't, I didn't check how many thousand crested geckos were on work market. I just did last night. I think there's 4,500 listed. Ten, there, it's only 10%. Well, there's only like a couple hundred garks, right? So, like, yeah, it's. If you're going to get into crested geckos for this is breeding, if you're going to yeah. get into crested geckos and you want to breed, um, if you're going to buy, let's say you're going to buy a male and then two or three females to put with that male. If you really want to do it and produce stuff that you will not have very much difficult selling, you're going to have to spend average price. You're going to have to spend 1500 to two grand a gecko to do it right. These, right. this is buying, this is buying sub adults or basically sub adults, almost ready to breed. If you, if you spend, if somebody came to me and said, Hey, I've got five grand to spend on crested geckos and I want to breed, what should I do? And there's lots of 1000 to $2,000 crested geckos on morph market that you could buy and right out, right out of the gate, you're going to produce nice stuff. Right. Um, but that being said, some of my best babies that I produce that people buy every single one that I list for sale came from an animal that I adopted through my local herb society. It's a male crested gecko. His name is George. He's all over my Instagram. So you're then, saying we should go to Peco. And the female, <laughs> that he, 
but he's he's a he's look a, for caps. <laughs> he <laughs> fires almost jet black like my dog here, and he's got white yeah. and cream highlights. I like the dark ones. That's makes me. He's a got bad nice person. contrast. And the yeah, female, that fire really dark. It, it, even if it's like an ex- harlequin and it's really white, yeah. As long as it fires dark, and I like red too because like who doesn't like red? But like that's the ones that get my meat, my juices flowing. Right. Is any I, of the versions that fire dark? The contrast is where it's at. He's got really nice contrast, and I paired him with a female that has some contrast, but she's really light based. Her name is Evelyn, and I don't have a hundred dollars into those two geckos for what I paid for them to adopt them. Mm-hmm. And they the produce just, coming back. Just as long produce, as like the structure is okay on accident, yeah. which sometimes it is because people wholesale a lot of okay looking stuff. You know, and that the the female Evelyn, I actually somebody posted her in a Facebook group saying, "I have this crested gecko that I needed to rehome," and this was I I only at the time when I acquired her, I only had a couple crested geckos, and I'm like, whatever, I'll pick her up. I know how to take care of her. She'll do better with me than she's doing with the person that had her, and she this i put these two geckos together like what the hell not it's a male and a female let's breed them and see what happens and the babies are amazing they're mm-hmm. it's just it's crazy but if i'm not going to discourage somebody from getting into crested geckos but if you're going to do it you better throw down the money and buy good stuff and, and you, you think no crested gecko breeder would give you a testing guarantee or anything or what do you think since they don't believe it exists in the crested geckos to begin with. I think you'd be hard pressed to talk to any well-known crested gecko breeder and say, Hey, I'm going to buy a gecko from you, but I'm going to test it on intake. And if it comes back positive, what are you going to do for me? They're, they're, they're just going to be like, their head. So some spin. of them have like seven day health guarantees though. So do you think those people would like, and you'll get a turd within seven days, hypothetically, you know, hopefully. Yeah. But see, and so like, they give you a seven day health guarantee, but what does that entail? I don't know. That, That's I'm, I'm right. like, I haven't talked to anybody. So I'm getting, I'm trying to get you to gauge how interested these people are, or is it just buy stuff, hope for the best, like a spray and pay prey policy with your money. Well, no, I breeders. think if you're dealing with a reputable, reputable breeder like me, or I can ramble off a bunch, you know, morph menagerie, fireside geckos, um, you know, Brian Butler at Altitude Exotics, Tiki's Geckos, you know, any of these people, they're going to give you a health guarantee, but... But not a crypto guarantee because it's too... Right. Confusing right. or specific. Right, because if you say you're going to test on intake and you test one of their, a gecko you purchased from them and it comes back positive for crypto... <sighs> I don't know how they. It's would do it's that. hard until somebody like right. sits down and like internalizes it and goes, "Oh, like okay, or 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 no," because I don't want to deal with people right. potentially knowing. But obviously, even if I didn't ask for a guarantee, they could send me a gecko, and I could be like, "Well, you didn't want to refund me, but it obviously came with crypto because I tested it on its first poop here." I would I would compare, and then I could make a stink out of it if I wanted to because I have a podcast and I like to complain on it. Pretty right, the, push, the, the pushback you and Jana have received from some people when you've inquired about their testing policy. You think that would be like consistent? So you're saying I be, can't get into crested geckos. That's what you're telling that, me. The last thing you want to do, Jessica, is get crested geckos. I, you're not, you're I not, like you, that they're evil looking a little bit. I like cave geckos better because they're more evil. But the dark crested geckos. Cave, cave geckos are great. Um, there's... I the, like that there's like a bunch of species. So you could have one from each island. And yeah. When I, even, I, I look at the New Caledonia stuff. You know, everybody talks about you got crested geckos, gargo geckos, the lychees, the saracenorums. But there's all the bavia stuff. They're basically big giant morning geckos more or less. You know? And... There's a ton of stuff from New Caledonia that not a lot of people work with that I think is super cool. You know, there's there's so many geckos that are just I there's I could probably name 50 species that I'd want to work with, but I don't have the room. Right. And I don't, you know, there's just there's too many. <sighs> I mean, there there is a lot of appeal to me to like pet 
animals that are good like so there's a lot of breeding potential but they're also like convert to pets easily and like the yeah. general public knows what they are so that's why i the breed boas, corn snakes and ball pythons so it has the to like fit the model of it can be a good pet too the the pictogecko is to me is as good if not a better pet than a leopard gecko it's basically you can is it, kind it, of treat it would be the, too small for a little uh kid though hi right? shane Oh, no, and you're you're probably not going to want to handle a pictogecko a ton, but you can interact with them. You you know, my God, I don't know here. how much if Shane Tong feeds his leopard geckos, but you can interact with a pictogecko and Tong feed it, and you know, even feed it with your fingers. No, like Shane, we've been talking for three hours. Yeah, we're gonna finish up here because uh, we got to wrap it my up. My body is rambling. dying on the inside and the outside. Yeah, but no. final thoughts. Uh, Aurelio says, the only way to do this is have the breeder test prior to shipping and you test once you get it. I would be into that, but I just need a crested gecko people person or gecko person to like come to me like an adult and let's talk it out because I am scared right now to even message anybody because they're going to be like, you're hysterical again. I've already well, done this for well, three years. Would, go, to, me, go to Richard. Hello. If, if, I know, I know. But he does wholesale and he does dowels, and I'm not that into dowels. So how many uh, like extreme dark based Harleys and or Oh, I, I mean, got We can talk. talk. We can talk. All right, let's talk. All right. Me, All right. me I will tell you. I'll get I some cave geckos out there, from what's it called? Put this out there into the ether. So anybody that watches this or listens to this and gets to the end of this three hour rambling. I know. Um, if you buy a crested gecko for me and you're going to test it for crypto on intake and I have no problem with that. All right. I would encourage you to do that. Yay! Thank God. We have our <laughs> first victory in the crested gecko community. Richard is being a real team player because you've already gone through it. So you suffered. So obviously we don't want right, to expose you to a lot of liability, but just that, that first little the first poop that comes out, we'll ship that off. And then if it's good, it's, we'll just call it good and keep biosecurity up after that. You know, and Wally, that Wally Kern from Supreme Gecko was in here earlier. Is he a cool dude or do that? Oh, he is amazing. All right. He is. He is. He's, How does he, what does he think about testing or crypto? Don't out him. Actually, Don't get yeah. in trouble. I have, Don't just I say, have no idea. Ask him. But yeah. <laughs> if you want to talk to somebody about the business of Crested Geckos, the thing Wally is doing geckos now full time. He's retired, does geckos full time. The reason That's he cool. does geckos and the reason he's into it is because he likes hatching baby geckos and selling baby geckos and interacting with kids. You go to his table at any of the shows in the Wisconsin area that he's from. He's he's got kids all over his table. He sold so many geckos to so many new people and brought so many people into the hobby. He. He's into geckos. He's into isopods. He's got it all. He is just, he's an amazing guy. I wouldn't be into the picta geckos and some of these other weird geckos that I want to get into if it mm -hmm. wasn't for him. And yeah, I think there should always be somebody encouraging people to do rare species that could be the next crested gecko or the next right. ball python because they maybe are like better pets or smaller or the, the picta gecko could be the next leopard gecko, but. There was a time five, six, seven years ago, people, the only reason people bred picta geckos is to feed the snakes and other lizards that eat lizards. Mm -hmm. They were a throwaway animal, you know? And there were a lot of cool, geckos. There were a lot of cool morphs in the picta geckos that kind of have disappeared because people mm -hmm. quit working with them because nobody wanted them. I mean, I could rant about the picta gecko thing for a long time, but. We gotta wrap it up. We're all yeah. Hungry. Yeah. All right. Where can uh, people find you on the internet? And do you have anything for sale right now? Uh, or are you still have, just doing I, just wholesale? Is there anything on I Morph think Market? I have a few animals listed on Morph Market. I don't have anything like active ads out there floating around on the internet. Okay. But if there's if there's something you're looking for, if it's a Dalmatian, I've got Dalmatian stuff. I've got Harlequin stuff. I've got stuff He's available. Got it all. Just message him, and he'll hook you, know, you up. I don't. I don't have any Lily Whites. I but I've got I've got some stuff available. Um, I saw in the description of this, my links are down there. My Morph Market, my Facebook, but yeah, create a create a Coriolophus on everything. Um, you can if you can send me a DM. 
if somebody watches this and they want to get into crested geckos or they want to, they're breeding now, but they want to ramp up production or, you know, they're really going to go into it mm -hmm. and they want another perspective on what I did and how I grew. I mean, I'll talk crested geckos and breeding and all that good stuff for hours and hours with everybody. Oh, we'll have to bring you back for like round 78 or something. Um, hey, but I just, I appreciate the opportunity to be on here. Say my piece about the testing and about what I went through. Yeah. Maybe this will make crested gecko people want to test a little bit. Yeah. Thanks for being brave enough to share your story. Yeah. A lot of people are hesitant to do that, but it was really awesome to hear from you and to learn about crested geckos. And if you guys have more questions or interesting crested geckos, please reach out to Richard. Yeah. Hit me up. I will. I'll talk geckos with anybody and everybody. I mean, Jessica, hit him up after the show. <laughs> well, I don't know what I'm doing, but I, I obviously had to like look at Crested Geckos all week to get ready. Then I was like, I guess I should buy like 50 or 100 or 150. You know, it started to escalate wildly in my mind what I would do and how and when. You're going to like... <laughs> start with one or two and then you're going to end up with the. I'm a volume keeper i'm always like yes yes you are yes i'm gonna have to i i don't I, all right I, let's say goodbye and then we'll chat I have more than 500 snakes rooms. currently i found out because my husbandry pro tied me out and i was like whoops all right whoops. thank yes, you so I much just, everybody that watched that listened that i mean it's been almost three hours i appreciate it um give me a follow give me a like drop a comment in this yep this podcast is great um i'm a fan um you know let's you didn't pay him to say that by the way <laughs> there, there there's there's a there's a there's a whole bunch of other things that i got to do a round two and i want to say and talk about but vote Jana in the snakes and the fat man contest Woo! team Jana king Woo! all right guys all right. we will catch you next week same bye. time bye see it's ya the longest pause ever